Evening. I'm calling to order the April 25th special study session of the Palm Springs City Council. First order of uh, for us is to call roll. Council Member Holstitch? Here. Council Member Kors? Here. Council Member Woods? Present. Mayor Pro Tem Garner? Here. Mayor Middleton? Present. All members are present. All right. Uh, next item, is, although it's not in the agenda, but it is something we do, is the Pledge of Allegiance. I invite everyone to stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As a reminder to everyone, this is a study session. We will not be making formal uh, motions. Uh, we may provide direction to staff during the course of this evening. There is only one item on the agenda, and that is our first review of the uh, fiscal 2022-23 uh, general fund budget. Uh, with that, the next item on the agenda is public comment. And I invite the city clerk to make contact with those who would like to testify. Max Deirda, followed by David Feltman. And Garner, uh, the member of this uh, council and staff. My name is Max Deirda. And I'm here to inquire about the capital project and the upcoming budget specifically related to Pickleball. Uh, there have been two recommendations. Parks and Recreation has recommended for the existing courts to have uh, windscreens, new lights, solution to the uh, DG, decomposed granite, and I think a water fountain is desperately needed. This could be a quick win by the council to get this done before the fall. Uh, the second one is the, uh, the new, uh, new pickable courts as, requ as requested through Measure J. The Measure J minutes of uh, March 17, 2022 recommended yes for regular Measure J funds. Engineering is to review. Ensure there is no, less, uh, no net loss in the tennis courts in the city. I'm here to ask the city manager and each member of the council to include the funding of new courts in the amount of $1 million in the next year's budget and improvements to the existing courts. Thank you very much, and thank you for consideration. This is it. David Feltman, Palm Springs. Hello on the TV screens to council members, mayor, mayor pro tem, council member staff. Thank you. Um, well, last week I said I would do my homework uh, after speaking on Thursday night. And I did do my homework um, and read the staff report. And I'd like to just make three points. Um, I would ask the council and the staff to please make capital projects and associated accounting for these projects transparent so the public can better understand how that money has been spent and will be proposed to be spent. It was difficult to understand these larger sums from the staff report. I actually am not sure it was there. Um, ditto for Measure J. If these were covered in the staff report, they're very difficult for the layperson to understand. Um, and finally, I'm here to ask that you follow the Measure J recommendations of the March 22 minutes for two allocations of 500000 for a total of $1 million to the Plaza Theater and not allocate $2 million as proposed. I am concerned about how this line item developed as this represents a potential exploitation of privilege by an anonymous individual who reportedly tied their contribution to the Plaza Theater to city funds. This attempt at leverage was made known extensively in the public domain. It was intentional. But this council is allocating public dollars and there should be no circumstance where a private anonymous funder uses his, his access and leverage to drive the city budget. 
If you have excess dollars to spare, I suggest that you focus on something with greater social equity, such as investing in parks and rec infrastructure or cutting user fees for parks and recreation activities like preschool programs, youth programs, camps, etc., which largely but not exclusively are used by middle income and low income residents of Palm Springs. They deserve this money as much as anyone else, if not more, as they struggle with inflation that we all know is real. We know from filling our gas tanks, from the cost of bread to other grocery items, that our low and middle income residents are struggling now. Thank you, sir. Your time is up. And my time is up. Thank you. Naomi Soto, you're live at the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments, and you may begin. Hi, um, good evening. Uh, my name is Naomi Soto. I'm Vice Chair of the Measure J Commission. Um, and I just wanted to make a few comments um, on some items that I noticed that were noted with Measure J funds, as well just kind of as a resident, um, some things that I've seen uh, needed. So just a couple of points around the Measure J funded. So item number 17, an engineer project manager as well as the item 40 and 41 um, are all noted as Measure J items. Um, and at least for 17 and 40, those are items that the Measure J Commission has not discussed in any form whatsoever. Um, and so just want to make sure that the council is fully aware of that, that that's not something that we have um, discussed. Around item 41, um, around the Plaza Theater, um, it has been discussed the last few months. And it's been at um, a half a million for this fiscal year and a half a million for the next fiscal. Um, so just wanted to make those clarifying points. Um, pers personally, um, I feel uh, conflicted using um, Measure J funds for staffing. Uh, I recognize in particular for the engineering project managers, it would greatly improve, but that's not something that there has been... Um, a ton of unison on. So just kind of putting that out there for the council's awareness. Um, and I just wanted to note something that was um, particularly troublesome for me was around um, the fact that they're not recommending a digital communications manager, but there is a recommendation for $100,000 for a branding guide as well as $50,000 for a party. Um, when as a resident, I can't even tell which park is going to be open and functional or which water facility is going to be open for my toddler and infant. Um, and so I go to Cathedral City to be perfectly, perfectly frank because their facilities are um, tend to be open more regularly. So I think a communications manager to help facilitate a lot of the social media content would be extremely valuable. Um, and I look forward to discussing this, uh, especially with Metro J funds um, at our next commission meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Claudia Sloan, you're live with the city council. You have two minutes to provide your comments and you may begin. Thank you very much. Uh, I would just like to suggest that if there is a surplus right now, uh, that the land called Boulders and Crescendo should be donated for land conservation as was originally expected when it was given to the city from Westman or, or obtained from Westman, uh, and, or at least to put a conservation easement on it, uh, again, as was expected. Uh, so I would very much like to stress that that would be great for many, many, many reasons, uh, all of which I think have been discussed numerous times. Thank you very much. Madam Mayor, that concludes our list. Thank you to everyone. We will now move on to the staff report. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. We're here this evening to have a first presentation and discussion about the next fiscal year budget. So this is a pretty lofty document and a lofty exercise, so I recognize that there's a lot of context probably missing um, from the, the staff report, which we hope to illuminate a little more 
this evening. So just to take us back a little bit, you will recall that last year, around this time, we were presenting a budget for the fiscal year that we're still in, right? January 1st until June 30th of this year. And you'll recall that we were still in the middle of the pandemic. Um, that budget started to show recovering revenues. So some of the uh, positions that were eliminated had been restored. But at that time, we really still weren't even fully recovered and still had a number of vacant positions. So over the course of the year, we um, recovered nicely financially. We were able to fill those positions. So ultimately, everything that was cut or frozen had been restored. And then over the course of the year, we've also been able to add some targeted positions in areas where we wanted to grow capacity. We engaged in a strategic planning exercise in November that helped us establish a broad range of strategic priorities. And since then, staff has been meeting um, on the side and basically coming up with proposals to meet the needs of those priorities, to, to tie future investment uh, to those goals. So this evening, we're mostly focused on the general fund, which is the city's main operating fund. But there are others in the city that are equally important. Um, a, a large enterprise fund is the airport fund. All, all an enterprise fund means is that functions a little more like a business opposed to the general fund where most of our tax revenue comes in and most of our operational expenses are, are located. That said, if we make good time this evening, we're able to talk at a little more of a conceptual level about either the airport budget or CIP or other components of the budget review. But it was intentional that we started with the general fund as our main operating account. <coughs> So in order to kind of streamline and, and make a little more sense of this large document, even the general fund, if you really look at it in the context of line items, kind of goes on and on and on forever with, with a lot of numbers. So what we're going to do this evening is first help you understand trends in revenues. The trends are good. We've had growing revenues over the course of the last year. That means we have new opportunities to invest in programs, projects, and services. After looking at our revenue projections and making sure that you buy in generally to our approach to forecasting future revenues, we're going to look at our base expenses. Those are expenses that essentially council has already committed to. So those are the departments we all know very well, like police and fire, but it's also some of those new um, positions and things that were allocated over the course of the last year. Now, the base budget does grow over time because we have inflationary pressure. We have things like increased costs for fuel. Um, when we adopt MOUs with our bargaining units, those generally contemplate increased commitments to payroll and benefits and some of those things. So we'll describe for you at a high level what is driving the increases to the base budget. So some of the new revenue that's coming in to, to kind of um, shortcut to the end is committed to increases in the base budget, not new programs. But to make it really easy, what is part of the base and what we're proposing for new investments, we've kind of segregated all of the new requests and we'll look at those individually so it's really clear where we're proposing to invest in new programs and services. For the most part, the general fund is preoccupied with our, our operational divisions, so those are re mostly requests for personnel but not exclusively. Um, we also look at things we might do with our accumulated fund balance. So those are dollars that have accumulated over previous years that are now available to be invested above and beyond whatever amount we ought to set aside and not touch for, for stability purposes. So we'll look at all of that, get your direction, and then as I said, um, anything else we need to do. This is our first meeting. So if council wants to look at in more depth in a particular area of the budget, whether that's a department or you know, a category like personnel. Um, we're looking for that direction as well as direction on where we've proposed making investments. There's a lot of context, and I'll explain some of that as we go through these requests for funding. Um, some of even what was mentioned on the calls. Um, there are instances where it's not that um, staff isn't proposing a position eventually, but timing becomes a factor, right? So, so sometimes we think, um, let's say, a communications position is likely valuable, but we don't think we're ready to describe that position, to cost it out, and to do everything that might be involved in the budget process. So we'll explain that item by item as we go. But we're looking for direction on those new investments, as well as anything else that you want to see as part of the budget presentation. We'll have another work session, a study session, on May 4th where we'll continue whatever conversation we don't conclude this evening, and then we have opportunities to present any follow-up information basically until uh, mid-June, where we aim to adopt the budget on time 
um, ahead of the July 1st start of the fiscal year. Even that, just to comfort everybody, is not the last bite of the apple. As we know and I just described over the course of this current fiscal year, we made numerous budget amendments when we saw opportunities to make new investments and knew that we had the revenues to do so. So while we're really trying to get a lot of our priorities in line with the budget exercise, it, this is not the last opportunity, right? So whatever we don't get exactly right carries over into the, the next year. Any questions before I turn it over to some of our finance team to start looking at numbers? Okay, that's it in a nutshell. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Nancy to get us started. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and Council members. I'd like to start with the PowerPoint. So if IT could display the PowerPoint, please. Thank you. Um, since I've been here, I don't think we've ever kind of discussed what the budget process actually looked like. So a couple just uh, highlight items is that um, we did go on a new financial software, Tyler Muniz. And this allows for all departments to enter their budget into the system with exception to touching any of the salary information. We went ahead and met with most, um, almost all department heads with the city manager and finance. And after we did that meeting, I personally went through and looked at each line item by line item by department. And if I did see a spike in a certain um, uh, expenditure, maybe contractual services or travel and training, I went ahead and called the department. We talked about it until, and, and, until it made me feel comfortable. And that was how we got through this year's budget. I like that they got to enter their own budget in the finance program, but I don't know how excited they were about that. Okay, our next slide is going to kind of show you we had 18 and 19, and then if you notice the revenue for 1920 is when COVID did hit. So right now our, our revenue growth is mainly driven by the increase in tax revenue, which consists of TOT, sales tax, property tax, and utility users tax. In 21, 22, and 22 and 23, we have grant revenue. So in 22, we have approximately 15 million of grant revenue. And in 22, 23, we have approximately 31 million of grant revenue included in here. The next slide is going to go ahead and show you our sales taxes, basically our major major taxes. So if you notice in 19, we had uh, sales taxes 23.4. We dropped when COVID hit to 20.9. We're estimating this year to be at 30.1 million. Property tax slightly goes up each year. That really didn't change too much with COVID, except for they did extend um, payments um, out another year. If you could not afford your payments, the state said, okay, we'll give you one more year until you can get caught up. Cannabis taxes is continuing to climb. And we saw a spike in utility users taxes. And because we're on the... Um, the new system, I didn't want to increase it too much for next year. I want to make sure that the correct revenue is going in this account because there was a really big spike in the utility taxes. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, the next slide shows an overview of the TOT taxes from 2010-11 until 2022-23. Um, uh, the major note will be again 1920 where you saw a drop in the TOT taxes due to COVID, but then it rapidly picked up um, the, the next year and we saw a big growth coming in this year and anticipate that same growth next year. Now we go on to the expenditures. Um, we were all very careful. We did very, each department um, was very careful in, uh, in spending it um, during the COVID process. So if you look at 1819, it was 140, and then when COVID hit, we went down to 124, and even even lower in 2021, and then the increase in 21, 22, and 22 and 23. Um, one of the things I wanted to notice that we're having more maintenance and expenses and facilities because we backed off and deferred um, repairs and maintenance during COVID so we had a so we could save some money. And the same is true for vehicles. We um, deferred it, um, our purchases, and we did a couple leases, but not very many. And now I would like to introduce you to the new um, Assistant Director of Finance, Chris Mooney. He started here in January and he will go over the fund balance schedule with you. 
we need a tutorial on this? Is it on? Okay. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members. I want to walk through the fund balance schedule with you. Uh, it's on page seven, just for make sure we're on the same page. Um, that the fund balance is really an accumulated surplus over time. So uh, at the beginning of 22, we had a fund balance of $52.4 million. We're in the third column over uh, the green, just uh, says fiscal year 21-22 estimated actuals. Uh, so 52.4 million is where we started. If you scroll down the schedule and look at the surplus and deficit in that column, which is 22.3 million dollars, that's where we expect to end up at the end of this year. That means that we will begin fiscal year 23 over in the very last column at the very top with an estimated fund balance of 74.7 million dollars. As you walk down that column, you see the revenues of 186 million and expenditures of about 149 million, and that's a number that we'll come back to in just a minute. And then we have an estimated surplus at the end of 23 of just under $8 million. Uh, the fund balance uh, is broken up into two pieces. Uh, we have initiated a required minimum fund balance this year. That's 20% of the operating expenditure. So back up to the 149 million, if you take 20% of that, you get the required minimum fund balance of approximately $30 million. The excess, 52.7 million, is for the city manager to make recommendations to the council on how to spend. That gives us a total fund balance of 82 million. And with our calibers reserve, the fund balance we anticipate ending with at the end of 22 right now is $113.9 million. Be more than happy to take any questions if there's any. Uh, could you explain uh, the 113 and the CalPERS uh, reserve set aside? I'm not sure that um, I'm understanding those numbers. So the CalPERS reserve is an amount that we set aside every year to uh, help with our unfunded liability for CalPERS. Right. So uh, that's additive to the fund balance. It's added, but we're not. It's not actually available to spend. Uh, it's it's technically classified as unassigned, but no, we we don't. We do not want to spend that. We want to take that to the uh, unfunded liability. So ultimately, we would want to deduct the thirty-one two fifty from the number at the bottom. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So so the, yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Are there other questions for staff? Go ahead and continue. All right, thank you. I think for at this point, Did I'll turn it back over to Nancy. Sorry. We'll go to the next slide, please. Right. Council Member Kors, did you have a question? Um, yeah, uh, for Nancy, since she's back. Um, when we look at our general fund, one of the items I got some questions on is sort of large item of all other sources. Um, and that's bef is before subtotal and then transfers in on page two. Can you explain uh, for the public what is in that, please? Thank you. Um, which number are you talking about? Is it in 22, 23? And what is the dollar amount? Um, and let's see. In, on page two, oh. if you general fund, if you go down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines, you see 22,679,148. And then in the revised budget for 21-22, it's 37,938,103. All other sources of revenue con um, consist of uh, charges for services, permits, Anything that you don't see here, we have a lot of um, building permits, a lot of building costs, fire inspections, um, recreation fees that we collect. It's all of the sources rather than the main, um, the main taxes that we, you see at the first page. Okay, so Does when we get the, you? yeah, and when, when we get, well, just some two people who reached out on that just wanted a little more specific. So when we get the budget, you'll, those will be more itemized. Yes, so you, will will see a, you will see when we do the budget in a brief, it'll right. list every revenue account that exists right. there. And if we want to see more of them, I'd be happy to bring them and put like them on a slide so you can see all revenues. But it, mostly we've always been focused on the main revenues, which is the taxes. 
but I'd be happy to break it up next time and just, you know, we'll have the budget brief hopefully attached at the next meeting. So you will yeah, see all, no, the, all the revenue sources. Yeah, and that's perfect. Um, I think that that will help explain it all. So that's helpful. It's just a big number that's, you know, um, caused a little confusion, but I, I'm used to seeing it when we have the full budget. So um, I think that'll work for everyone. Thank okay, you. great. Any other thank questions? You, Not for me, thank you. Any other questions from anyone? Go ahead and proceed. I know we'll come back with more. Uh, Council Member Holster. Thank you, Mayor. Nancy, I just have a question about the slide showing the projections and thank you for including the information pre-pandemic because I think it's really important to look back at the last few fiscal year cycles and budgets and not just compare to the last one, which was both, you know, actually a post-pandemic, though we're not post-pandemic, but a post-shutdown boom. Right. And so could you just detail it looks like you're really comparing and your projections are much more similar to this past fiscal year than the pre pandemic years, if that makes sense. So could you explain the forecasts of, you know, continuing the boom and the increases even to what we're seeing now and sort of how you got to those projections? Well, what we see today in our financials um, is TOT is very high right now, and I can t continue to see that going on. I I budget very conservatively, so that's why um, Justin had mentioned we could probably come back. But we did what we see happening this year. I slightly bumped it up, maybe two percent on most for next year. So I didn't want to go crazy and go, oh, well, predict that it's going to be 10%. I want to be a little bit more conservative. If we need to come back um, quarterly or mid-year, I'd be happy to do so. We do have a sales tax consultant that we use, and I used um, some of her reports for the projections also. Thank you. That's really helpful, and I do know that you usually project conservatively, and that's sort of the debate we had pre-pandemic or right at the beginning of how much it would um, affect our budget and how much we'd have to reduce. Um, and so, you know, that seems like the important thing here is, is projecting that out. So I appreciate your expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, Nancy, I have one. I would like to uh, see for fiscal year 21-22 the uh, quarter against quarter comparisons of revenue for the major items that uh, of revenue that you're talking about uh, with sales tax, TOT tax, property taxes, and in particular, it's the sales tax and, and the TOT that's most uh, uh, volatile that, uh, that we want to take a look at. And I concur and support uh, being conservative as we approach uh, the estimates, but... Uh, uh, we also want to have a good sense of where we're likely to uh, to end up uh, uh, next year. It, it is, we know, much easier to add uh, than it is to subtract. And I do have a report that I keep on these okay. by um, by every month. So okay. that should be able to, I'll give it to you at the next meeting, if that okay. works. Great. And I, I think I stepped out of my bubble a little bit more with Justin, said, don't be so conservative. You need to step out of your bubble. The only thing I'm worried about is right now inflation. We don't know what's happening again. So mm -hmm. that's another factor where I'd, I'd rather come back at, at, um, in a quarter and say, this is where we are right now. Let's bump up the revenues a little bit more instead of coming to you and saying, well, I'm sorry, we're not going to get an, an extra $5 million, so we're going to have to you know, cut all the operating expenses. I'd rather add than have to subtract. Right. Uh, and I want to thank you for the format that you used. I think summarizing this data and having the most critical items be as visual as they are is really helpful. Uh, but uh, I, to go to Councilmember Coors' comment, when the public does want to be able to dig in and go to the, uh, the detail they need to be able to do so. Are there other questions? comments then go ahead and continue please powerpoint please thank you 
Justin's going to walk you through these um, city manager recommended line items. So council, uh, as we mentioned, um, we wanted to segregate kind of the base budget and then look at available funding. We look at available funding two ways. One is what we'll describe as one time or, or money that we recommend ought to be used one time because it, it's basically accumulated savings. So once you spend it, it's gone. But then we also have an amount that we're projecting for revenues over operating expenses. And that money, given that the economy at least stays where it's at and we don't go into some sort of recession, should be available to come in on an ongoing basis. And it's therefore more appropriate to spend on positions and, and things that we expect to sustain over time. So what I would say is that this budget is fairly assertive in programming new expenses. Um, I would venture to guess there haven't been very many periods in Palm Springs history where we've had the opportunity to make this kind of investment in one time or ongoing expenses. And, and we've largely taken advantage of that. We always wanna be careful knowing that things come up mid-year. Um, we could think of a handful of examples this year that weren't part of the early budget conversation, but turned out to be significant priorities. So as we go through the individual categories, what I would say is overall, we wanted to do a handful of things. One, we did want to be assertive in spending, not to the detriment of our financial position. In fact, as uh, the finance director described, we still want to be reasonably conservative so that we don't need to cut later. Um, and as the mayor pointed out, it's easier to add than, than to cut. But that said, we also don't want to leave a lot of money on the table. You can see what's happened over the last few years, even during the pandemic with our fund balance. We've been conservative to the point where we, that fund balance has grown even in some of the most trying times. And we do want to make sure that those dollars are working for Palm Springs residents. So we wanted to be a bit assertive while still preserving the opportunity to reevaluate over the course of the year. And then in some instances, and, and I'll describe some specifics, I may have not recommended a certain investment, not because I don't think it stands on its own, but because of other operational considerations. So um, I'll outline a few of those, but ultimately some of it just comes down to timing, right? So something like a communications position, I'll just use that one as an example. I certainly think we need one, but we're also in the process of re-envisioning how that department operates and likely bringing on a position that council has already approved which would be kind of a, a chief communications or public relations officer. Well, is that person going to be very adept at one thing or another? Maybe it's social media and digital presence. Maybe it's other traditional forms of marketing. Um, how are we going to use the other team members as we reorganize this vision? It leaves a lot of questions. So in recommending that we don't fund that position now as part of the budget, what I'm really saying is I'd like to evaluate what happens after we grow the team a little bit, assess our strengths and weaknesses at that point, and then tailor a position to whatever our needs are thought to be at that time. We could just as easily add something like that as an appropriation as a placeholder, but I didn't want to miscommunicate, especially uh, to the staff team when it came to making those recommendations. So if you're ready, we'll kind of go through top to bottom. Um, one more thing about process. I apologize for some looking at the screen if the numbers are a little small. I'll try to um, articulate as much of what I'm looking at for transparency purposes. We had a lot of meetings. We used a standardized form to ask department heads to submit budget requests that were um, in light of council's priorities. So all departments engaged in that exercise. Departments also then engaged up the chain, if you will, to their deputy or assistant city manager or the city manager so that those administrators were responsible to know what the department's um, priorities were within a department and then also what the priorities were between departments. And then the group of us, along with the uh, finance team, got together to make final recommendations um, based on what we think are the overall needs. A lot of consideration goes into that, including the position we think the department is as a starting point, right? Some, some uh, are keeping up differently than others. So it wasn't about giving everybody an equal amount. It was about looking at the starting place of each department, looking at the merits of the request, 
understanding the consequence if funding was provided or not provided, and then balancing all of those requests in light of our available funding. And like I said, preserving enough that we could go into the fiscal year knowing that we can still make some additional investments over the course of the year. So that's kind of what underpins all of this. And as we start at the top of the list, you'll see two positions proposed to be added to finance. We have some one-time costs. Those are generally related to things like computers or furniture or something that we might need to outfit a new team member. But what you see in the right column for recommended ongoing is the fully burdened cost for that personnel. So a budget manager is roughly 166000 and an auditor is roughly $149,000. Important to note with our finance department, like a lot of departments, they, they provide an internal service, right? And, and we want to make sure we're doing more to help our team understand their operations from a financial perspective. So in particular with a budget manager, we're able to offer more assistance to our departments in understanding their financials, helping them prepare budgets and do those kinds of things. So nobody really owns that position, which is why we have the director and assistant director leading the conversation today. Um, and then with the auditor, this is simply an opportunity to be a little more engaged with our external stakeholders and ensuring that everybody is fit, paying their fair share and on a level playing field, those positions tend to pay for themselves because um, whether it's intentional or not intentional, sometimes people miss um, what they're supposed to pay. And, and by um, discovering that and, and asking people to make the city square, um, we generally recover the funds that we invest in that kind of a position. Next, we go to an IT technician. Um, you'll notice in a few places something awkward like this where it looks like we are proposing a half-time position. What that really means in this case is half the position would be paid for in the general fund. The other half of the position, I believe, is proposed to be paid for by the airport enterprise, which, again, operates kind of like an independent business. So what you're seeing here is the general fund um, side of that. But we do see growing IT needs throughout the organization, especially in places like the airport where we've tried to be more creative with space. So shared, um, shared um, gates, for instance, requires new software. So one airline can log in one day and the next airline can log in the second or third day. And keeping those systems up and running, you, you can imagine, as we've seen other operational challenges at the airport, how important it is that we're responding to issues with technology and keeping up with that. And then the overflow half position, anything from kind of help desk types of calls to help people when uh, a computer or something isn't working right. I mean, every once in a while, it's, it's email or logging in or the VPN or you name it, um, let alone looking at new opportunities to deploy technology. The GIS technician, um, we, we have one. Um, I'm familiar with having one in organizations that are much smaller. You've seen the power of those tools as we look at things like vacation rental data, and we're able to geospatially locate um, things like the number of uh, code calls we have and compare that to the number of vacation rentals we have in a neighborhood and have really dynamic mapping. That's really what we get out of GIS, and um, it, we're due for another person to help us with those kind of data. With our police department, we're proposing three new officers. Um, please, what I invited the police chief to do is come up with a number that he thought would get us a little bit of relief. But bear in mind that we have an outstanding project coming forward, I, I hope, in the next number of months that will take a much deeper dive into our operations at the police department. We'll look at calls for service. We'll attempt to um, come up with ideas to grow our team to meet the service calls in some traditional ways and in some creative ways. So for instance, you'll note that there were a couple of requests for um, behavioral health um, people to, to, to be part of our police department team. I, I support that fully. The only reason it's not recommended at this time is because I'd like to see the results of that department review. And if it needs to be more than that, we would propose more than that. Um, in particular, I want to make sure that we also have kind of the management structure and the operational plan to deploy those kinds of resources. So I would just rather it get more completely packaged um, than having it part of this budget process. But I, I'm virtually certain when we're done with that exercise, we will engage council and have requests for additional investments in our police department. These three um, officers are meant to uh, provide us a little bit of relief, give us a little bit of room to recruit beyond our current vacant positions if we're lucky enough to, to find individuals to bring them on as we're doing that review.
And, and by all means, if there's an area here where council members have questions, um, feel free to interrupt. Otherwise, I'll just keep going down the list. I do have a question. Uh, thank you. On uh, specifically the police department, what we know is that uh, we're operating generally with fewer officers uh, on staff than we have authorized. Uh, I'd like to see us take a, a good, serious look at how many officers we tend uh, to be under uh, what's authorized and take a look at whether or not we need to allow for more individuals to be hired in order to account for uh, the c constant uh, understaffing that we have due to sick leave, uh, due to injuries and due to uh, inability to hire. Th thank you, Mayor. That is the intent as we complete that review is, is, is a part of it is theoretical, but a part of it is very real, right? So if we have a certain level of calls for service and we have a certain number of officers available and there's a gap, that's our gap. It's, it's easy to say, well, in theory, we have another 10 officers and if we had them, they'd be able to field those calls. Right. Well, when do we have a normal year where we're fully staffed? I mean, I, I've been doing this a little more than 15 years. I recall, I, I'm not even kidding, what seemed like about 10 minutes that I've worked with a department that was fully staffed. It's been, it's been, it, so that's a reality that if we can count on it, we should plan on it and, and, and plan accordingly. It's a reality in almost all of our departments, but when you get to the departments that have much larger staffing, that's authorized, then the impact of it becomes much more significant. Thank you. Madam Mayor, if I could. Yes, go ahead. Um, one question for the city manager also is, um, I know this is sort of our first look at this, so um, I'm not expecting you to have all this information uh, tonight as we sort of talk about this for the first time, but number of positions that we might want to hire, but we're not ready to because we're doing, you know, study with police and we want to see who the commu new communications person is before we add the next one. It'd be really helpful, um, whether it's for the next study session or the first meeting in June, to know what all of that would cost. Because even if we're not approving it for this year, because we're, or we, we're not going to hire them for six to 12 months, it will impact other one-time expenditures we might want to spend money on, right? If we have another, I'll just pick five million in staffing that we think is going to come on board, that's going to impact how much we want to spend on other things. So I think that'd be a helpful number for us to know what that looks like and to have a sense from council what we think we want to see in staffing. Um, well, I very much respect when you're not ready to hire someone because you need to see who else is coming in or you're waiting for a study. Uh, I think we're going to need that information to make informed decisions. I hope that makes sense. Thank you, Council Member. That, that makes a lot of sense. And part of the reasons why I included a list of those positions not recommended for funding is exactly that. So that you could see, um, make no mistake, I don't think any of these were gratuitous. I don't think anybody was just kind of you know Christmas shopping when they um, outlined what they thought their needs were. So right off the bat, I can tell you that there's about another $2.5 million in positions that have been proposed that have merit that aren't recommended as part of this budget cycle. One of the reasons we hold back is because despite our best efforts to always wrap our arms entirely around the needs of a community and the services that we need to create to meet those needs, it, it's just dynamic, right? And, and we come across things mid-year, sometimes it's responding to opportunities, sometimes it's responding to circumstances like the pandemic where you realize you need to shift a little bit. So I don't know that we'll ever get a finger exactly on total needs, but certainly um, the 2.5 I referred to refers to some that are specific. And we could always, um, in some of the areas where we're really scrutinizing operations like PD, come up with some things as more of a placeholder, but that would at least put some scale to that need so that um, you have more to keep in mind than just what we've shown you today. We, we can certainly do that. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Holstich. Thank I'm you, sorry. Mayor. I saw you nod, but it's a little hard being on Zoom and in person and doing a hybrid meeting, but I really appreciate your help. Thank you. Um, I completely agree with Councilmember Kors's point. Um, and I 
would love to also have the information about staffing levels prior to the pandemic and comparing those cuts, because I do think we talked strategically at that time about departments and like council member course noted the future of departments and how to get there. Um, and so I think, you know, looking at, again, that's my kind of overall comment for this report is it kind of leaves out the historical context of where we were pre-pandemic right before, if that makes sense. So it looks like larger increases because it's not looking at, you know, the prior fiscal years. And then same with staffing. I really want to see, you know, for example, to include, um, you know, what those cuts were, um, where we got back to, and then, yeah, what's the additional need over time. Thank you. Yeah, we can produce some additional information, uh, especially high level information that would help you understand overall FTEs. Um, I, I think I can say with confidence that we are getting back to pre-pandemic and then moving beyond pre-pandemic, right? So um, we will have a larger team and be invested in more areas and more robustly than ever before because we have a strong uh, economy and, and that's really facilitating them. Um, but we can get more specific context for you that will help you understand where we see some of that growth. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Other questions, comments at this time? Thank you. Okay, if we can put the PowerPoint back up, I'll pick up where I left off. So I had mentioned um, three traditional officers, and then there are also two other requests coming from PD, a crime analyst and a crime scene technician. Those are a little bit self-explanatory just given the title, but the crime analyst in particular, as the chief deploys a, a new version of community policing, neighborhood policing, it's really um, heavy on data and heavy on understanding those analytics as a means to help solve problems. And then crime scene technician is um, ultimately a way to conduct some of the necessary investigations, have somebody that's really immersed in that skill set um, while not having to rely as heavily on some of the traditional law enforcement personnel that might perform that activity so that they can go on to the next call. So these are just other support type services that will help the police department uh, operate at a higher level. With our firefighters, um, we've been asked to invest in, in a pretty significant upgrade in level of service. It is um, a recommended um, standard when you look at kind of um, NFP 17. It's, you know, the, the promulgated documents of really how we should be running our fire department to keep people safe, to respond optimally, et cetera, suggests that we should be running four people per apparatus. We really run three. So we want to start building into that higher standard of, of four. We're not able to get there all in one step. And I understand that we may need to tweak this number a little bit um, before the end of the process because I think given the, 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 the staffing, it likely needs to be six to kind of create the, the right balance and, and give the chief what he needs to at least achieve this level of staffing in some places, uh, in some stations that have a higher call volume. It's also just worth noting that, that like police, fire are responding to more calls. So bottom line is as we grow, even when that's not permanent population, but say the visitor economy and other things, um, they get the calls and, and they have a substantial increase. And this will also just provide additional flexibility in responding to those calls, staffing, you know, and all the same things we see in, in police where when you're down somebody from, you know, on injury or leave or something like that, having a little more flexibility with how to assign people um, and not have to rely as heavily on overtime, which is, you know, something we'll always have some of, but um, we don't want to live on that, right? We'd rather have uh, the, the size of team we need to handle the call load. So this helps us build into that. And then a fire captain training and, uh, for training and administration just gives the chief the opportunity to, to delegate some of those training act activities a little more directly, have somebody own that. And again, as the team grows um, and it's a team that's constantly training like the police department, um, we want to make sure that they have the right people um, to really guide those efforts and, and focus full attention on keeping our team prepared, which is serving our residents and keeping our team safe. 
Building Safety Administrative Secretary, Secretary, we actually had two requests for administrative uh, positions in both building services and engineering. We're proposing as a first step that they share an individual. And so that's another case where, you know, at some point we really might need two. Um, we want our um, some of our building inspectors, our engineers to be spending as much of their time in their niche area of expertise, right? So having support staff around them helps to make sure that they're freed up to do the job that, that only they can do. So for now, we'd like to have uh, one position assist both teams um, as we bring somebody on, given that this request is approved, um, and we see how that person works out and, and what we're able to accomplish. We may come back and say, at the end of the day, we do need two, but uh, one will be a step in the right direction. And, and again, it, this enables us to evaluate before we commit. Uh, to both. Next, you'll see a homeless outreach coordinator. I just want to point out, and you'll likely recall that um, council had already approved a, a hybrid position, a position that was intended to be dedicated both to housing and homeless services. So that was the first attempt for council to recognize our need to grow capacity in those priority areas, but we found it very difficult to recruit for that position. And, and in part, it's because <clears throat> people tended to be really steeped in one of those activities more than the other. Granted, there is overlap. <clears throat> Certainly housing is instrumental to homelessness as one example. But number one, given the prominence of both of those um, categories, affordable housing and homelessness in our priorities and noting the challenges that we had recruiting somebody that had experience in both, <clears throat> We're proposing to split them and have positions in each. Well, we have funding allocation that exists already for one, right? So that would help us get the, the housing coordinator. And now we're proposing creating another position for the, the homeless outreach or services <coughs> so that we have one person dedicated to each of those. Excuse me, I'm talking too much. Moving on, we have a number of parks and recreation positions. These are coming not only because the council's identified these as priority areas and, and kind of the, some of the um, standard services that we need to enhance, but also because we've had issues in these areas um, and, and resident complaints ultimately. So we think making investments here will help us provide better services. So we've got a recreation facilities program coordinator, um, a park attendant slash park ranger, a court attendant, and then a DeMuth recreation assistant. Um, some of those you'll see the bottom three are two positions at 0.75. Um, that provides the team some greater flexibility in scheduling and, and hopefully gives them what they need uh, to manage um, all of these various areas with a little higher level of service. Um, thank you, Justin, on, on that note with Parks and Rec, um, I, I appreciate seeing these positions. I think we know we've talked at length about about the need there. Um, but one thing with Parks and Rec um, that we've raised before is there was a literacy coordinator position that did services primarily at I believe all at, at James O Jesse Community Center, um, and it was a really great position. Uh, the woman that was in that role retired, and I believe that that we have not filled that role? Is that a current vacant position or was that position eliminated? I, I'm just really would like us to be able to have this, this position back. Um, we don't have enough childcare and preschool programs. Uh, the district is currently backlogged and the kids who want to get into pre-K can't. So anything that the city can do to go back to something we were already doing to kind of f fill that would be great. Thanks. I'm going to invite Jeannie, who you know is um, oversees our library, but is also serving as interim director of Parks and Rec to see if she can help us with that. Sure, thank you. Um, excellent question. I know historically, a long time ago, the literacy coordinator was under the library. So at one point, um, this person was under the library, and then it did fall under Parks and Recreation, and then when the person retired, I believe the position was just eliminated. I, there's not a vacancy right now for that, but that position was eliminated. Okay, so that, that's something that if we can get some information for next time to see how we can add that back. Um, and this, I would be especially interested to find out, if we can from the district, what 
uh, kind of where we're at in terms of numbers of of youth that are being uh, that are unable to attend pre-K. I think that would be helpful, and kind of what the need is um, overall. And I'm sure, probably Jeannie, the staff at at JOJ probably can give us some numbers, at least from there, since that's where the position was before, in terms of any children who are currently hoping for that <laughs> position that we could, that could benefit. And Mayor Pro Tem Garner, are you most interested in that there's youth programming there, or is it specific to literacy, or a combination would be open? It's specifically to the literacy because it was for the pre-K group. Um, so I know I went in once a couple of years back uh, and read to the kids, and they're all like you know four years old. Um, even I think there was a couple of three-year-olds as well, but it prepared them for kindergarten. Um, and it was actually really helpful too uh, over there because they could be close to home and didn't have to travel to an elementary school as well. But now we're seeing that the elementary schools are, you know, there. I think the, at Catherine Finchie alone, there's 30 students who are trying to get into pre-K and can't get into pre-K. Uh, so it's, there's certainly a, a huge need. And uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner, I know that there is a school site, right? A, a, isn't there a pre-K site at the Desert Highland Park? I believe that the school district runs. I think we have a contract with them to operate a facility. Yeah, I think then that's part of the confusion is what is actually happening there because there there was, but then there was reports that that wasn't running anymore and... We'll find out. So if we can just, yeah, any any yeah. additional details and finding out, you know, what it is we actually need, uh, because I, it, it was a position, like I said, it was closed due to a retirement, not because, to my understanding, that we don't want it anymore. Oh, Council Member Halstead. Thank you, Mayor. Um, please let me know, Mayor, if you'd rather me just jump in. Um, it's it's, I know it's hard a little to hard to see uh, this evening, so. Perfect, so then I'll just flag verbally. Um, thank you to Mayor Pro Tem Garner for raising that point, and that was my larger point that she made better than I did really concretely, is I want to see the list of positions that were cut or unfunded during the pandemic, because I do think that as we're adding new staff, we need to see that are there positions that, you know, or people that we want to bring back um, that we could do first. So I think that that's really important. Um, and then, yes, we had worked with Palm Springs Unified on Head Start programs when we changed Tiny Tots to Head Start. And they had also talked about expanding Head Start and that there was space at James O'Jesse and it never, I think, moved forward um, that I know of or I wasn't involved in that. So thank you, Mayor Pro Tem for Garner for raising that and um, good opportunities here to provide a lot more services to our community, both ones that they expect, like the literacy coordinator and then new ones with new staffing. So thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Then please proceed. Thank you. Picking up where we left off, item 16, um, we have a librarian. So that's the only request currently coming from the, the library. Um, next, we do have an engineering project manager. There, there is a note there saying Measure J. Uh, it was already mentioned that this has not been formally proposed to Measure J. That's absolutely correct. Um, this is as much kind of an internal note for me to re you know, remember to say that this may be a potential use. Um, one of the things that we've discussed with the Measure J Commission even recently, and we'll discuss with Council more extensively as we review our capital improvements plan, is that that team is, is really catching up on projects, some of which were started five, six, seven, eight years ago. So now we're looking ahead um, for five years, but we're still catching up from maybe five years ago. And it really begs the question how much capacity we have. As we get into areas like the smaller community projects that uh, Measure J recently uh, reviewed, um, same thing. So even to take the step of reviewing that list and vetting it for accuracy, cost estimates, scope and scale, and those kinds of things, which really um, Measure J did a great job evaluating 
those projects with the information that they had, but there could be some surprises there, right? Where, where something might cost more than what we originally anticipated when that review was done because they really just can't quite dedicate the time as they're immersed in big projects. And as we'll see when we start to look at that uh, capital improvements plan, there's some very big projects on the horizon, some big bridges and some other things that are really going to occupy the team. So one way or the other, I think we need something like an additional project manager. It might be a nice alignment with Measure J. We would have to ask uh, them to see if they would be interested in recommending that kind of an expenditure. I certainly understand the downside that we want those funds to be used for direct investment, but the truth is we might be waiting much longer for that direct investment if we're not able to implement those projects. So this is one way that we might grow our capacity and, and work to catch up um, and, and really eventually get on schedule with not just a capital improvements plan, but one that grows as our economy um, grows. So next, we go into a pretty substantial list of requests for our maintenance department. So our maintenance department really covers a lot. They have crews that are dedicated to downtown. They have crews that are dedicated to streets, um, some that are focused more on parks, some that are more focused on fleet. And in general, um, they could use additional investment all across the board. You know that we've received um, complaints when there's a mess to be cleaned up and we can't get to it right away. Um, as our economy has really taken off, we see more visitation, we see more activity in town, and it just translates into greater needs. So um, we'd seek your support for things like uh, a downtown maintenance lead worker and then two additional workers. That, that's really creating a small crew. So in addition to just having more hands on deck, it also enables that team to, to rework the schedule and be available in some of those shoulder hours where right now somebody may not be available at all, ensuring that we provide a, a higher level of service. Similarly, with street maintenance, um, you see uh, something similar. Um, there we're just adding, I believe, one. Um, lead park mechanic and all these parks maintenance positions um, are per, these services right now are being provided by contract so we're proposing to adjust that contract and bring some positions in-house so there is an offsetting savings associated with that and you see that number um, outlined below where we think we could offset 541,000 of these costs which is the vast majority so that enables us to you know, create jobs um, in our organization where we have union representation, um, good benefits, you know, high, high quality of life, especially when residents are able to get those jobs. And we think it will help us to enhance our commitment to things like our parks. Not, not to claim that our contractors aren't, but um, it's a different thing, especially if you find someone in the community that loves the community, that wants to have a career in parks and can be dedicated hands-on um, and, and earn a decent living. So we, we see that as um, very valuable. And, and so that's a pretty big shift for us. Um, but we think it would enable us to be more responsive to the kinds of service requests that you're used to seeing in your emails and, and on, on the phone. Um, questions about any of the maintenance investments? I don't know if you're getting any questions, but I hear some silent cheering from uh, more than one of us. We'll take any cheering we can get, silent or otherwise. So that, that works. Thank you. I have a question, um, and I very much support the move from contracted services to in-house wherever we can, because like you mentioned, those are good paying union jobs. Uh, for our residents and for our residents know that we're working on building hiring um, in, in our community. So I just have a question about um, some of the positions. Could you show the slide again, please? Um, so in terms of, I know we're just looking at the one time and can you clarify what the one time cost is? And then I assume the ongoing is the total benefits and compensation. Yes. Thank you. Whereas the smaller one time cost that you saw with some of the other positions or things like computers and office furniture, where you see the larger costs, you're typically looking at vehicles. Oh, I see. So when it says one time, I assumed maybe it was partly recruiting, partly, yes supplies so the larger costs like lead park mechanic with vehicle the 40,000 is for a vehicle 
Yes, that's right. Now, that would be a total, so that could also contemplate things like a computer and, and furniture, but the difference between the 5,000 and 4,000 you see in some of the other positions and the 40 is the vehicle. So we're trying to be very transparent and consider um, full costs and present at least the significant ones and present it that way. Thank you. I appreciate that. And then are we considering the cows? CalPERS obligations and sort of the longer term costs of those positions too? How are we sort of thinking about, you know, because remember back when we were here doing this three years ago and making significant cuts, we were really worried about our obligations and how we would pay for them and not increasing that. So here we are being recommended to add a number of new staff and new positions and new departments, which I think we all generally support, um, but just wondering how we're thinking through the additional cost implications on the back end for CalPERS and OPEB. Yeah, I, I'd ask Nancy to address that with a little more specificity, but ultimately we calculate the payroll numbers, not other staff teams. And the reason we do that is so that we can consider all the roll-ups, the all of the fringe benefits, health insurance, short-term disability, PERS obligations, and other things that go along with um, payroll costs. That is correct. Um, we don't know what the long-term um, cost is going to be for CalPERS or OPEB. Um, Justin, I met with a consultant, and Justin is trying to get leveled payments. And we're thinking about um, meeting with, when we meet with the consultant, we're going to get information options for the council to determine what options they want to go with, if they want to go with a 115 fund with CalPERS, or do we take that money and um, spread it out over years so that our payments are now going to be level and not keep going higher and higher? Yeah, from our cursory review of that, it looks like what the city has set aside, that if you were um, going to set aside another $6 million, which is one of the proposed um, one-time uses of some of our um, unassigned fund balance, we'd have over $30 million set aside in that fund that I think might be sufficient I don't want to get too far out in front of that exercise, but smoothing over some of the next handful of years where we do expect to see incremental increase in our unfunded liability as, as kind of an annual number before we start to see a decrease. So we're always going to have a typical pension obligation anytime we have uh, personnel. We've set ourselves up well so far. If we still have additional work to do on the unfunded piece, um, I think it's going to be manageable because of the good work to set aside money in, in previous years. If I could, uh, I want to make sure that we're keeping uh, a couple of things uh, separate here. One is just simply the cost of any employee is going to have pension obligations that are built into the salary numbers. Is that correct? All right. And then the second question is uh, how do we manage the increase in costs that, uh, that we're seeing in our pension obligations? And I really... Uh, advocate the kind of study that you're taking and uh, doing. Uh, I know that uh, I sit on the Riverside County Transportation Commission. They paid ahead uh, their obligations when sitting with uh, a cushion like uh, we are looking at, and it has resulted in some very significant savings uh, there by uh, taking advantage uh, st simply of the opportunities CalPERS uh, affords any agency to pay their obligations ahead. Thank you, Mayor. I really appreciate your expertise on that. And I also support staff's recommended plan to look at those ongoing obligations and the cost to the city. Um, city manager, could I also ask, I had missed it, the firefighters and fire captain. I missed the opportunity to put my question in. Can we talk about that now or do you want to talk about it at the end? Or are you going to go through the additional requests listed and requested but not recommended? Uh, we will cover that list, but this is as good a time as any to ask about those positions. Okay, thanks. So could you just go through sort of more in detail the, the thinking there um, and the plan? I know the firefighters and the fire department have been asking for adequate staffing levels for many years, um, and that's a priority that we've been working on with them. So um, I was just wondering sort of um, the timeline and the numbers for the fifth out of the 15 they recommended. It sounds like you modified to, to include six, is that right? Yes. 
So if you could just sort of explain, or maybe the, also the fire chief, um, why that number was picked over the other one requested, and then more information about this fire captain training and administration, because um, I've been working on this issue for a few years now, and um, that's the first time I'm seeing that position um, and would love more information. So I'll ask Chief Nalder to come up to talk a little bit more about um, the rationale for those requests. But in terms of why the number was recommended, it really just comes down to that being a pretty uh, substantial lift all at once and balancing the overall needs to invest in areas across the board, um, preserving some funding for things that are yet to be determined, like an evaluation of our police department. Um, uh, as I'll explain in a little bit, we have some placeholders in some areas like homeless services, um, um, housing is a really big priority, which not only will take ongoing operations money, but likely more than a single position. So it's really just with an eye to the future that we say, let's let's tackle a chunk of this transition to four per apparatus while still giving us the ability to monitor the economy. Um, it, it might not be right around the corner, but at some point there will be a recession. Hopefully that's more of a leveling, leveling off of revenues and not a substantial decline. But we're always kind of planning so that ideally the conversation we're always having is where can we invest next and not where do we cut to, to kind of save the day. So it's just meant to balance overall priorities, um, a, an approach that is both assertive in investing in services while cautious enough to set ourselves up for financial stability long term. Okay, so what would you like me to start with specifically? Um, the firefighter question or the captain question, the firefighter question? So we've had meetings, um, and I don't want to get into too much detail, but the reason that I asked for 15 was that will get our city to a place where we will move from uh, class three ISO rated city, that's your ins insurance service organization, to a class one, which is why we've been talking about this for years. And I'm extremely impressed with the city manager that he remembered the NFPA standard 1710 for adequate staffing for fire departments. And the, the reason we got to that number as well in our right up to the city manager of needing the 15 was based on our city and the occupancies in our city and how we could have the best outcomes and getting appropriate resources. So how NFPA establishes that standard is based on tasks that are specific to types of occupancies. And um, it was a deep study. Um, you've seen the standard of cover study we had that identified a combination of both human resources in our firefighter staffing and additionally um, maybe some relocation of our fire stations to improve our response times. Uh, so that's how we came to those numbers. Um, the city manager did ask me would would if we could because it's going to be difficult to get all 15 um, can we get part way there and I said yes um, and I'll let that transition into and I, I can tell you though um, and and uh, not a huge ask. Um, six is fantastic and it gets us moving in the right direction. And we have a lot of other ways that we could potentially look at, as the city manager said, moving in the direction where we could find revenue sources or other ways to get to our 15. Um, if we did have nine, I can tell you I could probably um, adjust our staffing across all of our stations to get us to the requirement for ISO um, to get us to a class one if we did have the nine. So I just want to throw that out there. I'm not saying, you know, my, I, I don't know the overall budget. That's not my choice. That's policymaker and the city manager. So I don't know where we are on that, but I'm, I just wanted to throw that out there uh, for food for thought. The captain, um, the captain we asked for because if we're going to increase, we have our training, we have a training division, we have to uh, hire the new firefighters and we have an academy. We have mandatory training on an annual base th basis that we have to meet. Um, we have um, uh, California standards that we have to meet. It's called Cal Jack, and we have to meet those standards. The workload with our current staff, we have to draw on on um, our our 
operations personnel to assist us with all of that training. And if we're gonna add these 15 people, um, I actually place that high on the priority list for my request to be able to get these new firefighters trained, but also the workload that comes with maintaining the training, maintaining the records management for all of that training, um, which is a, a large volume of work. And that's why I asked for that position as well. Thank you, Chief. Really appreciate that information and your leadership of the department. Um, so can you say that again more clearly? So you said, or in a way I understand, um, so you said if we get to nine um, firefighters added, then that changes our classification? Yes. Six, six will move us, potentially could get us to a class two. Nine, I can, I can adjust the staffing to get us to a class one. Thanks, Chief. And then could you tell us about the timeline for hiring firefighters and the captain, too? So I know often there's a long lead time in terms of recruitment and, you know, training. Um, and so sometimes when we allocate funds, even for like 15 position or, or a large amount of positions, mm -hmm. it actually takes multi years to fund them. So could it, you just detail that timeline? Yeah, I can. And I, I probably should have identified the fact that these positions we're asking for are not paramedic firefighters. Um, it's really hard to get paramedic firefighters today just because of all the fire departments. And there are a number of fire departments actually at 4-0 staffing already um, in Southern California. But um, it's very difficult and we're having a really hard time with our diversity and with the number of applicants and actually qualified for firefighting, not just the medical part of our organization. So actually this request is for EMTs um, and they have to kind of go in tandem because to have a paramedic EMT combo, we need the two firefighters on the apparatus instead of, when we're 3-0, we only have a captain, a driver, and a firefighter. When we're 4-0, we can have a captain, a driver, a paramedic, and an EMT. This will hopefully open the door up to be able to um, have programs, our Explorer program and things where we can um, reach out to the high schools, the College of the Desert who has a fire science program there and start drawing more from our community rather than having to draw from, I mean, we're getting people from Northern California applying just because of the paramedic requirement. And it's really hard to, to keep it local if we do that. So it's, it's a multifaceted approach to this, uh, and there's a significant cost savings um, of a, an EMT versus a paramedic. They don't get that paramedic incentive pay. Thank you. I, and then I just have one other question, um, and it's not really on the, in the staff report, um, but in terms of balancing capital improvements that the fire department needs so desperately and staffing, could you just talk a little bit about the priorities there? Yeah, um, as far as what, what are we um, comparing the priorities of the firefighter to the officer that was requested? And. I mean, you could do that, but just thinking through, like, I know that there are capital improvements we very oh, much okay. need for our stations. And so how do we balance as council sort of looking at what capital improvements for buildings and other equipment for the fire department versus staffing? What's more important to invest in? Well, they're kind of, they're kind of, they kind of go hand in hand. <laughs> so um, if, if we have the standard, the people first, um, that would probably be the top priority and then um, relocating the fire stations and bringing on because our current fire stations like station one is 65 years old and it does not meet modern standards and we can't even accommodate female firefighters at that um, at that facility uh, along with the only one that actually can is station four with a makeshift at station two but not really um, so we we have a we have a a facility for that, but it's not the way it should be laid out in modern facilities. So the facility has many different, um, a long conversation of reasons why that uh, is also a high priority, but I would say for the community, getting adequate resources on scene um, 
human resources on scene would take the priority um, because we're, we're adding a couple of minutes and response times by relocating the fire station, but getting the proper, if you can get four people there, um, OSHA requires two in, two out. So we have to have, uh, if, no matter what um, first in due district a fire engine comes from, it requires the a further away unit to get there before we can even affect a rescue because we have to have two firefighters to be able to go in and two firefighters to be outside in case something goes wrong. So, it, and that's an OSHA requirement, Cal OSHA. Thank you, really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. You're welcome, thank you. Helpful. Any other questions or comments? Mayor Pro Tem. Um. Thank you, Councilmember Holsich, for answering or asking all of the questions that I also had <laughs> about the fire department. Um, but I do have a question about the vehicle purchases. It looks like we have quite a few vehicles that need to be purchased. Um, and I know that we've talked about this before, moving towards purchasing electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles. I know that with maintenance trucks, uh, we're not quite there yet with being able to acquire electric. but um, can you talk a little bit about what we're doing as we're purchasing to make sure that we're, we're doing so in an environmentally friendly way? So one of our biggest needs is going to be infrastructure and electric service upgrades. We have, um, we have added some charging stations both in public areas and associated with facilities that help, but really to move in that direction in a, in a stronger way, we're going to need a pretty big investment in infrastructure to support the charging. So hybrids are certainly easier because you know they, they still run on a traditional fuel, fuel source. Um, we do have in mind to do that. I think our first step with our fleet inventory is to really get a, a better handle on exactly you know, which vehicles need to be replaced when, which vehicles can kind of be retired down into service, um, whether or not we're going to be leasing or buying, establishing a fund. So that's one of those liabilities that we invest in annually and ideally level payments. So there's no surprises where last year we only needed two million and then the next year we needed five million for new vehicles and that kind of thing. Um, but as we get a handle on that piece and as we accelerate um, progress on our climate action plan and invest in our sustainability department. That's one of the big questions that we want to ask and answer is how do we build out this infrastructure so that it really works, right? That if, if somebody needs more than one charge in a day or if they, if they all need to be charging overnight, you know, how many stations do you need and how do you accommodate that kind of infrastructure? Thank you. So to the, to the extent possible, I'd love to see more on that for this year to see where, how we can kind of move forward um, with those infrastructure changes, because I'm my concern is uh, waiting too long and then it being a, a, a much larger cost. And I know that there's interest in putting more charging stations generally in Palm Springs. Um, so how do we work with those partners to to get those in place and to assist us um, here at City Hall, especially for vehicles like I know we have several vehicles that are used that are just regular cars, right? They're not maintenance. Um, so how do we make sure that, at least with those, that we're moving forward um, and replacing them with the most sustainable option possible? Council Member Halstage. I just wanted to thank Mayor Pro Tem for raising that question because I got in the weeds with the fire department and that was also my question and I forgot it. So I completely agree with Mayor Pro Tem thinking through, you know, the investments when we're purchasing cars for five plus years and the cost to the environment and gas and all of that very much would like to see those investments sooner rather than later and also look for funding for eat more electric vehicle infrastructure, which I know is a priority for the community and the council. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, uh, then. Uh... Okay, picking up where we left off, I think we've covered most, if not all, of the personnel requests. And then we have a handful of either uh, placeholders for some services um, and some one time costs. So, starting with the Public Affairs Department materials and supplies, that's just uh, mostly some small numbers that we need to support a position that we've already created. Um, it looks like we are anticipating our 85th um, anniversary celebration. So there's some money set aside to make that a big deal given the nice um, round number of 85. 
Um, marketing and tourism contractual services. I, I'm looking for someone to help me. My, I'm drawing a blank on what that number is. Does anybody remember? Or I might have to look it up. So um, marketing and contractual services, one of the things we had in here was for the branding. Um, but this one, I believe, is for additional con contract services. Yeah, so we have the branding a few places down. down. So marketing and tourism contractual services, is that a, is that a communications request? Yes, number 27. While we look for that and get um, some of the original forms out, let me just go ahead and continue and I'll circle back to that, um, or Nancy and Teresa can. Um, planning department, we've got one-time costs associated with a zoning code update, so you'll recall in our conversation about priorities and work planning that we, our zoning code's about 30 years old. Um, I don't believe that's probably the total cost. Um, I think that effort will span a couple of years, so this contemplates getting us started with that endeavor. Cybersecurity Operations Center, um, don't need to tell you about you know, the needs to continue to be um, careful and provide cybersecurity. Some of this pertains even to our liability insurance and things that people are expected uh, to have. And um, you know, wh where I worked previously, one of the neighboring communities was actually um, a victim of ransomware. You know, it's a real thing, so that we're, we're constantly making sure that system is up to snuff. Fiber, fiber master plan is, is similar, um, ultimately planning out where we would extend fiber connections to keep um, our facilities, you know, um, well connected. Yeah. And, um, Justin, on that fiber master plan, I think in this staff report it mentioned as well connecting the community to, to fiber, is that correct? Let, let, is uh, Jason in or can someone help us with that one? We might need to look at that one too for a second, Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, I think it, because it says here in the staff report about bringing high speed mobile internet into the dead zones around the city. Just. Yes, the answer is yes. We will seek, uh, part of that master plan is to not only develop the infrastructure, but also to seek grant funding and uh, any sort of funds which are becoming a lot available mm -hmm. to provide broadband to lower income. Uh, areas. Can you just briefly, I know it's probably complicated, but briefly kind of explain how you figure out which areas are dead zones and how all that works? We kind of know now a little bit um, based on where that fiber is, but the study, it's a study that basically looks at what we have now and then kind of analyzes how you can extend that. Sometimes it's with more fiber, sometimes it's with, it's with wireless technology or other kinds of broadband. But the, uh, um, the goal is to get, I think, Larry, do you remember what it is? 10, I think it's at least, uh, it's at least 100 megs out, out to, to the areas where there, there's no broadband at all now. Okay. So per facility, whether it's a business or a household or, or something like that. Great, thank you. So this is, this is really important, I, I think, for us. As we learned, um, especially during the pandemic, that there's several dead zones and I know Golden Sands Mobile Home Park in particular has just had in so much trouble and the kids had the worst time connecting um, to their schooling during, during that time. So anything that we can do to identify which areas are in the greatest need as well as we're moving forward to target those first, I'd appreciate it. And I know that um, Cal State San Bernardino is also doing work on this and connecting their students and they've are also working with grants and other things, so they might be someone that the city can kind of partner with to to do this because they've already started um, on their own. Yeah, and, it, and it's it's changing a lot. There's there's billions of dollars becoming available for this, and the state is re, is changing. They're kind of almost putting the onus for that middle mile and last mile they call it on the, on the local government to uh, build those projects, so, so to speak. So in that fiber master plan is identify where those areas you would want to build out and then build a plan over five years or whatever it might be to get that, that uh, bandwidth out to those areas. So thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Jason, before you go, I do think we need to see uh, some maps regarding where all of our dead zones are throughout uh, uh, the city. And in some instances, it's going to be in some of our lower income uh, communities, but not in all. Uh, and one effort that uh, 
uh, I think we should at least have some alternatives to look at is uh, do we continue to wait and rely on uh, the private market to bring uh, the, num the type of cell towers and other communication sources uh, that we need to our city, or is this something we should invest in ourselves? And, th and that's a big question that's kind of being answered at the state level now, because sometimes uh, the, the, the big providers, we're, we're working with, with Verizon now to try to identify some of those cellular dead spots right. to, because of the, the CAD system that we're bringing in and that sort of thing. And they're not always super helpful with that. So the state is kind of giving, getting that, and the feds are, are, are providing the, the, the funding to do that stuff, they're just kind of putting it in our hands to plan it. These are not luxuries for anyone any longer. Thank you. Just a quick note, um, really changing the game for connectivity is of course much more robust than uh, this fiber study. So especially as you look at missing middle mile, as you make operational decisions like are we building dark fiber, which means providers would come and actually light it up, so to speak. Would we build lit infrastructure? Um, where do we need um, rights of use or leases from incumbent providers, which can be very difficult? Even sometimes building the map on where speeds are, requires us to engage the community and ask people to participate in a speed test because most of the current providers don't want to ever tip their hat to competitors where areas are well served and not well served. So there's really a lot involved. I just don't want members of the community to think that by undertaking the study we might be really significantly down that road. We'll be a little ways and we'll be able to capitalize on opportunities like when we might connect a facility or there's a school or some other anchor institution that's connected and being able to leverage some of that for future um, development. Uh, but a lot of work to do and can be many, many tens of millions of dollars to build out that kind of infrastructure. But this gives us information that we don't currently have. Okay, so after that uh, fiber master plan, um, we've got a communications branding package. So there was a, a comment by a caller earlier just noting that it, it seemed like it might be a mistake to not invest in a position but to invest in this. Well, the, as I kind of indicated, the position is something we would reevaluate as we kind of reorganize that department and see what a, a new composition looks like. Um, but we do think that part of a, a good um, comprehensive communication strategy is some of the little things, right? So you saw the difference between the city's old website and a new website that was just refreshed, um, made a big difference. Um, there are a number of other little things that come along with some of the branding exercise, whether it's the, uh, the way people recognize city vehicles, um, it's, it's even little things like letterhead, et cetera, where we think we would want to invest in a foundation of what our appearance and brand is before we build out a lot of those new tools. So that's really what that's meant to, to, to do. Um, not to say that we wouldn't otherwise invest in our communications team. I think overall it's small for a community our size, but we'd like to grow incrementally so we have the opportunity to reevaluate. Re We're also looking at things like how we might connect with other departments to enhance communication. So in particular, IT. Um, I think, you know, needless to say, the world is mo moving toward um, you know, more video production and, and getting information out in ways that really inspire engagement. Traditional written materials and, and things like that are, still have a place, but one way to modernize would be to um, have help from people like in IT doing video production, which could enhance communications even if the position is in another department like IT. So still more to come there. Do you want me to go ahead? I can go ahead and clarify on the other marketing funds that were put aside. And those are recommendations for other discretionary marketing, including for the Chamber, the Chamber Magazine, um, the Concert Series, Film Festival Trailer, and other promotions. So some of these are historic costs that just haven't always had a place in the budget, like creating a, a trailer for the film festival. Um, some do represent new investments. So if you'd like to see a, a more detailed breakdown of that, um, I know one of them is to produce the PS I Love You more often than, than is current. So uh, that's kind of a, a line item that contains a few programs. 
If I can, Mayor, um, that would be great to break out. Thank you. I would be interested in more information about that, as well as the branding package for the city. Okay, great. Um, next, we get into a handful of uh, investments really in city infrastructure. So the first is a transfer to the facilities fund. Um, we need to make ongoing commitments to this fund uh, for sure. But right now, there's a catch-up period needed associated largely with deferred maintenance. We do need to do some analysis to better understand what our annual costs need to be to sustain our facilities. So remember that earlier I mentioned we want to annualize future liabilities. We want our pension costs to be level. We want investment in our fleet to be relatively level or at least to know what it is, right? We, we, we have volatility in the way we actually expend resources. Sometimes you need to make a big investment in a facility so you have a year where it's big and the next year it's small. And that all begs the question, how much do we really need to spend each year to make this thing sustainable? For now, one of the, reason, one of the ways we are using our accumulated fund balance is to establish funds that, that they, they already exist, but seeding them with some more money for catch up. So, so what I can't say for sure is that 6.817 is the exact amount of deferred maintenance and something else that we would put into the fund on an ongoing basis is sustainable. We still need to ask uh, and answer that question. But for now, we're taking some of the investments we need to make in these areas um, from our one time as a catch up, knowing that we still need to refine our analysis to determine what's needed on an ongoing basis. Same thing with a transfer to a new IT replacement. So same thing, right? We um, Computers are not nearly as expensive as cars, and cars generally aren't as expensive as facilities, but they're all future costs that we want to have our eyes wide open to. And so we would propose dealing with the IT costs in a very similar way. We invest an amount of money annually. This basically gets that fund started with a pot of funds, and you could see that as investing in the replacement of things two, three, four years ago that are going to come due soon, where we had not made that um, investment in those facilities fiscal years. It's a catch-up. And then next, you see a pretty significant placeholder for affordable housing. Um, I, I do think we need to look, and one of the things we need to account for in our incoming revenue stream is a broader commitment to housing programs. But a lot of the big costs for housing are when you partner with developers for projects, when you start getting into um, down payment assistance or otherwise of, uh, other ways of subsidizing housing. $10 million is, is a decent amount, but, but it can go relatively quickly once your programs are really firing. Since we're a little ways off on really creating a lot of in-house programs, this is more like an opportunity to respond to developments. So um, we might look at our properties later on in the year and say, this is a good one for a partnership, bring us ideas. And somebody might say, hey, if, if you can gift the property and help us with X amount of subsidy, we can bring in a tax credit program or something like, like we've done previously. So that's what that's meant to do is, is um, take advantage of that fund balance in a way that helps us uh, make that fund a little more robust to prepare for those kinds of opportunities while we still consider what else do we need on the program side to invest in people and, and the other elements of program to administer those kinds of costs. Uh, next, uh, transfer to fleet fund, um, $5 million. That's just like the, the one to facilities and IT. It's just meant to, uh, to help us catch up on some of our deferred replacements. We do have a number of vehicles that are beyond their useful life. Uh, the additional amount to the CalPERS is $3 million. I believe that's because we have $3 million already provided for, so that gives us a total of six. Um, and again, we could probably split the hair at some point of whether that whole six should come from the accumulated balance or some should be ongoing. On, on the assumption that some of it needs to be ongoing at least for some period of time, right now we're kind of splitting that. We take care of all of our other CalPERS obligations for standard payroll in the payroll uh, line items. This year we're proposing $3 million come from incoming revenues and $3 million from the accumulated balance for a total of six. Um, the if we, I'm sorry, Mayor, if we have questions or comments, should we jump in or are you going to pause and wait? 
I'll just jump in. Um, so sorry, it's a little um, different being on Zoom. So thank you for those recommendations. Um, really appreciate it. I just had a question about, could you describe the transfer to facilities fund for in-house projects a little bit more? So what projects those are, which ones are current, which are deferred, um, are those Measure J projects? Could you either now provide more clarity to that, or it would be helpful to know what that looks like and in, in detail what those projects are? Yeah, so I, I'd be happy to ask Teresa if, if she has some of that information at the ready. Um, with the in-house projects, these really are projects that, that I would like into our standard investment in facilities, but it's a definitive list um, of things that we think we can kind of do in-house, um, but really all of that pot of funds that's going into facilities is helping us address deferred maintenance or other regular maintenance needed at facilities. These are roofs, these are cooling uh, towers, um, it's, it's just run of the mill. Um, we do have a definitive list. The number of in-house projects was pretty specific. The larger number for investment in facilities is, is not. We know we have a plan that identifies about $100 million of deferred maintenance. So this is an attempt to kind of start to do more than what we've done historically as we also build the teams that can execute that work. So some of this number is a little bit of, a, again, a more like a placeholder where we prepare to do some of that catch up. Some of it we do have some specific projects identified. Thank you. And I do have that list. I just need to go get that on my desk. I do believe that was something we were also going to go over when we go over the CIP, but I can go grab that so we can talk about it more today. That's okay. Let's do that. It's, and whatever council would like, but that's okay with me to do it with the CIP. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and then if I just have one more comment on the affordable housing fund, thank you so much to staff and, and our city manager for recommending uh, really a significant investment in affordable housing. That's something we haven't had for a long time, and that's really important. I just wanted to note through my work as chair of the CVAG, Coachella Valley Association of Governments Homelessness Committee, to note for council and staff that Lift to Rise is cre has created a fund to help fund affordable housing projects regionally. Um, and they've gotten state investments. They have another state budget ask. The county has just is holding $2 million um, in that fund to build it up. And they've already funded five affordable housing projects that are now moving forward. So I might um, ask council to think about if we want to be involved in a loan loss reserve fund like Lift to Rise is doing that might help um, spur the development of affordable housing in more creative ways. So what they're doing, I think, I'm not an expert about it, but, you know, like gap financing or bridge financing or some financing that's not traditionally available that might block affordable housing projects from even coming forward. So um, I would personally am really interested in us leading the way and participating in this fund um, as a city and seeing if other cities will join us as we think of cities sending, sitting on $100 million or more. Um, how can we better invest that money into our community and leverage it for other money um, that we could get from the state or federal government? So um, I might ask that we learn more about that. I'm happy to help and bring it back when we discuss this next. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Justin, I, I do have one question for you. Uh, one of the issues that we've uh, talked about at length in the past is commitment to street repairs and bringing all of our uh, streets up to where they would have a satisfactory uh, uh, pavement condition index uh, score. So as we move through the budget, I'd like to uh, to take a look at uh, are there opportunities to jumpstart uh, any of those expenses? I, I, I hate to say this uh, since I've been such an advocate for uh, for street repairs. I am a bit concerned that the cost of petroleum is so high right now uh, that this may not be the best time to be uh, uh, doing a jump start. We certainly, uh, a few years ago, benefited tremendously uh, from having major projects ongoing at a time that uh, petroleum prices were uh, perhaps artificially low. 
uh, so that, uh, in the analysis as to how much we can spend uh, and how quickly, I, I would appreciate also looking at the question of is this the right time? That's great and very helpful, Mayor. I, I agree with you totally. Um, it is good to really look at the long game with that kind of roadway infrastructure, and you're absolutely right that um, as those prices swing wildly, you know, it, it can be very significant in terms of the, the miles you get per, per the dollars mm -hmm. you spend. Um, and sometimes waiting a year, you change that price a lot, but in the context of the age of a road, you, you right. don't always, um, some, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. So um, that's a good note. We are very aware that council is eager to look at how we um, maintain or accelerate that schedule. So we'll be able to discuss that. Great. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, so, so on that, I, that just reminded me of um, our pedestrian safety report and all of that that we've been talking about with bike safety and pedestrian safety. Where does that all fit within this budget? I know that we're still going to be getting a lot more detail, but can you kind of give us a little bit on that? Yeah, so, so to be clear, some of the detail is, is pending direction from council. So right okay. now we're focused on the operations fund, the general fund, um, which is mostly programs and, and people. Uh, as we look at the capital fund, we'll start to get much more into streets Got and it. sidewalks. In particular with our pedestrian plan, it's, it's very close to being ready to present to, to council. We've already been given the instruction through our strategic priorities to focus on things like bike, bike pad type improvements in the budget. Um, and in our five-year capital improvements plan, the real balancing act there is going to be not only with some of the other um, high priorities, but then we have some things that um, maybe aren't thought of as in, in the same light, but but that we need, right? An example, uh, at some point before too long, we'll need um, a, a new rental car facility associated with the airport. So doesn't serve the community in the exact same way, but is really important strategically for us in operating an airport. And so we'll be balancing all those things in the five-year capital improvements plan in the context that I described earlier, where we're still kind of catching up on some projects that started a while ago. You might remember that we presented um, a cycle eight pro projects that were coming through Caltrans. That's going to be coming back later so that we can evaluate um, the applicability of the CWA to, to those investments. But those were a bunch of intersections that had already been determined to have issues with um, accidents and things like that. Um, that, I think, call for projects was in May 9th, 2016. You know, and so we had just proposed finally closing the loop on that, but now we're going to extend it for a while as Caltrans and, and the Federal Highways Administration looks at our CWA agreement and, and contemplates adhering to those terms. So that's how long it can sometimes take. We, we hope to catch up with that when we start talking bike pad and road repair and the other things, but we're in the transition now from from mm -hmm. a, a period where we were really trying to catch up, especially through the pandemic while we deferred things and looking forward to get a lot of those exciting projects done. Okay, thank you. And I know you said this at the beginning and I'm still kind of jumping ahead to, this, <laughs> to the capital improvement. So thank you for that reminder of why we're not there yet. And, and by all means, um, it's a good time to get out the notes. So, so if something's in your head about, oh, I don't want to forget to talk streets or sidewalks, it's, it's not too early. Um, I'm making the notes and actually it helps us so that when we prepare those materials, we can bring them back with a focus on those items. So although we're not prepared to talk about it at length tonight, those are helpful. Well, just to throw another one out there, I'm very interested in discussions of the library for next time as well. And I want to thank the Mayor Pro Tem for bringing up uh, sidewalks, pedestrian safety, cycling safety. Uh, I share that. Uh, concern tremendously. Other questions, comments? Mayor, if I can, um, thank you to Mayor Pro Tem for raising the library as well. Um, I, I agree that's on my list as well as needed airport investments and just regular maintenance for the airport. Um, and that's why I asked for the comprehensive sort of measure J 
projects that have been funded over the last few years, you know, what's unfunded through Measure J, what those requests are, so we can look at comprehensively, you know, what that plan is. Because I'm, too, having a really hard time separating staffing with capital improvements, because while we have the money to do both, um, I just it's really hard without taking a comprehensive look at both to know, you know, is setting aside X amount for a library more urgent or more actionable or more important than, you know, staffing at this level, right? Um, or putting the money for the housing fund, right? Or is there better use of that money on other capital side, right? So I too am kind of struggling to separate, but doing my best knowing that we'll have that conversation and we'll have these numbers at that time too. Other comments? Okay. Thank you. Uh, just to make sure the public is clear, any investments in the airport come out of the Enterprise uh, Airport Fund and are not a part of the general fund. Is that correct? Yes, it's generally correct that an enterprise fund functions like a business, money in, money out, kind of self-contained. Um, we do provide a lot of services to the airport, and even those are charged back, so they're covered by the, by the airport enterprise. Um, that said, it still has an impact on operations. So, for instance, when we have a lot of capital improvements at the airport and those are managed by team members here, they're not able to do quite as much simultaneously with other projects. And that's one of the reasons I mentioned that context is to kind of set the stage that we want to have a, a, a robust conversation on all the fun things we get to do and invest in in the future with the caveat that right now we're still catching up on a bunch of projects, which is all a, a fancy way of saying um, it's going to take us a little while to get to some of those. We want to prioritize so that we're getting to the most important first. Sometimes the priorities are a little bit outside of our control when we have grant opportunities, external funding, or just big needs like we may have at the airport. Very good. Can I ask a question on that? So like art or other investments we might make in the airport, are those also from the enterprise fund or is that from other funds as well? The, the airport will be a conversation of both the operations and the capital. So, so all together in the airport, but still looked at as, as separate components of the airport enterprise. So you will get to look at both, the investments we're looking to make in the operations side and the investments on the capital side. And then we do have additional kind of partner stakeholders in that endeavor because we're always working with airlines um, to help address their needs. And the kind of lease agreement we have at, with, at the airport that enables us to basically collect what we need in fees to close the gap on the operations and capital side also brings them in as stakeholders. Um, so so our, our airport team will be equipped to, to help you understand that dynamic and guide you through both the operations and capital side. Thank Other, you. Go ahead. Other questions, comments? All right. Uh, okay. Picking up where we left off, we've got a couple general. This is a description that um, I'm not sure you'll understand. And Nancy, help me. I, I believe this is accounting for internal service charges where we have a general fund portion chargeback of facilities maintenance and a general fund chargeback of fleet maintenance for added employees and benefits. So that's where we are um, basically covering some of those costs for facility and fleet maintenance and charging back to departments. You are correct. Um, if you look at the staff report, the description um, for 38 and 39 explains what was added employee-wise to um, and the vehicles that were added and those get charged back to all funds and all departments so that's kind of what I didn't really know how to describe it as much but 38 will tell you what what um, positions are being added and also 39 and those get charged back to every fund and every department. So, so let me help. So, similar to the airport being an enterprise, it's kind of standalone. But if the human resources being provided to the airport are for airport employees, the airport pays for those services. Well, we, we handle our fleet and facilities in a similar way, but different. So we put funds into a facilities fund, an internal service fund, so that it's really easy to watch the, the money come in and the money go out but you have people administering those programs. And so we charge the various departments, charge. I mean, uh, PD has a bunch of vehicles, so they help pay for their vehicles and the people that are running the fleet department. So each 
department actually pays for its portion of some of its needs when it comes to fleet and facilities. The money's just kind of moving internally between funds. It's a little different in that the airport is a special kind of operation. Um, this is an accounting mechanism that helps us keep track of costs and programs in a better way. If we're moving on, the next thing we have is police and fire replacement radios. So you are all familiar, I believe, that the system we're currently participating in, uh, a regional joint powers authority uh, called ERICA has been providing some of our communications infrastructure. We'll be transitioning to a new system. And frankly, the radios are obsolete at this point anyway. So there's really no negotiation. We just need to pay for these. There was a note here saying that if this could be Measure J or fund balance. Um, we Again, to reiterate, we have not proposed this to Measure J. We're only indicating that there are other sources available when we make those notes. Um, certainly, we would want to honor the process of going to Measure J, asking them if they would like to recommend use of funds for something like this. But, but since it's not an ongoing cost, we don't need to spend three, you know, $3.5 million every year, we're proposing taking it from something other than incoming revenue, right? Either the accumulated balance or potentially a source like Measure J. But again, haven't, haven't talked with them about that, so this is just for you to know that there are a variety of places we can come up with the money we need for, for that investment. Uh, the Plaza Theater, th this is a, a placeholder, frankly. Um, I just want to reiterate that um, nobody came to me and twisted my arm, not a council member or anybody else. Um, so I'm recommending or at least suggesting that you can put a placeholder aside for investment in the Plaza Theater because the city owns the Plaza Theater. Um, I will say that I believe fully that for communities that have the kinds of assets that attract philanthropy, and other grants, we should lean as heavily as possible on philanthropy and other grants. Because if we don't have to cover the cost out of our discretionary funds, it doesn't mean that there are dividends, you know, it means that we're able to invest in something where we're likely not going to attract philanthropy and grants. That could be roadway infrastructure, bike ped, et cetera. So it's not unreasonable at all that even some of the donors may want to see the city invested in its own facility. That's so, so I've suggested a potential placeholder for that purpose. That doesn't mean we would jump to, to write that check today. Um, certainly if there were claims um, or reports that a, a donor wanted to see matching funds as a condition, we would, we would flesh that out in full detail before we made any commitments. But noting that it is a city facility, noting that we still have a decent gap in, in the goal of fundraising, this is one way to help close that gap or at least be provided um, the allocation for some sort of capstone funding if it's necessary. That's, that's why it's in here. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. You know, I, I think it's important that we're taking care of our city resources and the Plaza Theater is, is one of them. We've discussed that at, at length, right? The lack of um, infrastru infrastructure upgrades in the last several years. Um, I, I think with the Plaza Theater, I don't see any huge need to do it all at once. I think we can continue, as Measure J recommended, 500000 a year. Um, but the other thing that I just want to point out is that we have a huge renovation to do of the theater, but then once that renovation is done, the city will be then maintaining the Plaza Theater. So I, I, I just kind of want that to be part of the conversation as we are looking for that grant money, is that it's not as if the city doesn't care about the, the Plaza Theater, it's that we still will have an ongoing cost for decades for the rest of the, you know, the, the life of our city. So, so this isn't nothing. Uh, that we're not doing nothing. We, we are actually actively going to need to set aside those, those funds to make sure that we're, we're properly functioning. Uh, we have a properly functioning theater. 100%. And that's not just for the maintenance of the capital infrastructure, but likely the operations. So right. most, I, I shouldn't say most, many uh, museums and theaters and things of this nature um, aren't money makers. Uh, many of them to have the kind of... Um, programming you'd like to see are subsidized, which, which is not unusual, right? When we have a downtown park series, we don't charge tickets. We don't offset costs. It's an investment, 
for com the community benefit. So I'm not saying anything that's unusual there um, other than to, to agree fully with your point that mm -hmm. there will likely be annual costs associ associated with operations and, and maintenance. And again, I, I, I don't want to miss either point. One, you want to lean as heavily on philanthropy and grants for those programs where people have affinities like um, these kind of cultural centers um, because those same philanthropists aren't going to be here for the nuts and bolts stuff that, that we need some of that money for. But it's also not unreasonable to also be a co-investor um, for a facility like this. So, so we look to council on final direction on how much and under what conditions, et cetera, for an investment like that. But that's why it's presented to you is out of all the things that we could propose as uses for our fund balance, this is one of them. We also weren't trying to con further confuse when we talk about operations and when we talk about capital projects. And there was no magical reason why we selected this one other than it was a little more out of sight, out of mind when we were doing some of our early capital planning. And so this was one way to, to acknowledge that and nevertheless make a commitment or, or suggest a commitment from our available fund balance. If I could, uh, I agree completely with uh, the remarks that have been made. Uh, I wish we could get uh, private philanthropy to come forward for street repairs, um, but it's, maybe we'll have to talk through that one a bit. But uh, uh, clearly, the, the Plaza Theater is our facility, and I believe that uh, we've got a great opportunity, which has already been demonstrated, uh, to have philanthropy uh, step in uh, substantially on this project. And uh, one of the things as we look at uh, any investment from the city. I think it would be helpful to uh, see what is the total budget for uh, the complete restoration uh, and what's the uh, commitment coming from, uh, from the city. Uh, and uh, I don't want to jump ahead to what those percentages may be, but from my understanding, uh, if we were to go forward with this one, two million dollars, we would be producing substantially uh, a very small portion of uh, an overall budget. Not an insignificant one, but uh, so. I, I believe most recent estimates I've seen are somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 million. So to put it in perspective, you'd be looking at 10, 15%, something like that, but not, not, not a large uh, chunk of that investment. Other questions, comments? Uh, Councilman yeah. Cores. Uh, I'm looking forward to when you win the lottery and creating your own foundation for street repairs. So it would be very <laughs> beneficial for the entire city. So, uh, um, you know, I think on the Plaza Theater, and all these are um, good points. Um, you know, when I first read the staff report, you know, there are some capital improvements in here because, and I now understand it's because they may come from the general fund. But, you know, when we talk about capital, I think that's a good time to talk about that versus what else we have and what the right amount is um, on the Plaza Theater. Um, I know right, Measure J, we heard, had a recommendation of a million dollars, I think, 500 this year, 500 next. Um, and I just, I just wanted to ask for the city manager, historically, at one of our budget meetings, we'd start with a sort of study session with Measure J to get their recommendations and input, given all the work they've done, and for us to ask some questions. Is that something we plan to do? That's a really or good question. How do you plan to get that input? Yeah, um, so, so um, we discovered very recently, the last time we met with Measure J last week, you, you will recall last budget cycle, uh, staff presented the five-year capital improvements plan for the first time, and that included some projects that were designated to receive Measure J funding. At the time, council had indicated that it wasn't sure where those projects came from and how they fit into an overall um, community priorities. And, and so rather than allocating them by project, council directed staff to put that money aside as a placeholder. So um, I and most of the staff team, I think, had thought the whole time that Measure J had looked and evaluated those projects, made recommendations for its funding, and that that was consistent with the five-year capital improvements plan we showed you. We realized the last time we talked to the commission that they believed that they did not actually formally uh, approve those projects for your recommendation. 
Um, we went back and watched the meeting and think I understand where the, the conflict came from or the difference of, of um, understanding because staff did present the entire um, five-year CIP with projects that were slated in the first year or so, went through them, discussed them with the commission. There were generally positive comments, but I believe fell short of actually taking a vote to approve them um, as recommendations for council. So th this was going to be explained when we do the capital improvements plan in the budget, but we, I, I think it's reasonable at this point that we would want to take that back to Measure J. And I'm just talking about the projects where we would contemplate using Measure J funding. We would take that back to the Measure J Commission to solidify its recommendations before any final approval. That doesn't likely mean we can't review the capital improvements plan in its entirety. In fact, there are huge parts of it that have nothing whatsoever to do with Measure J. Um, but but at some point, we, we should do that. I don't know if it's the same kind of joint meeting that you're talking about, uh, Council Member Kors, although we were uh, made aware of that history. I was, um, being someone that wasn't here when that happened. So we can repeat that kind of exercise. Or, or by some other means, we go back to them, get their um, recommendation for investment in those projects before we solidify uh, next year's funding for capital improvements that would use Measure J funding. Thank you. Um, if I can, Mayor, thank you. Um, I agree with the comments that have been made and um, that the Plaza Theater should be considered in the overall strategy around capital improvements. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable that the city invest in that property since it's city owned and it would be a huge benefit for the city to see it revitalized. Um, so I think that's important, but it should go through that process. Um, and then, you know, because that's listed as a placeholder, the question then is, you know, what are those other placeholders that we might need for funding for the community? So I see you said home did homelessness there. Um, you know, in the past, we've talked about, we've done grants and sponsorships. We get a number of requests through the year. Um, there's things that the council's talked about, like reparations or universal basic income or other ways we can leverage state funding. Um, so I think, I think that that would be important to assess um, holistically all together. So one thing isn't you know, put at, put there and other things are not. Um, so I'd like to see, um, you know, larger conversation about how to invest some of the money into the community um, in ways. I know there are also things like we've talked about with council um, you know, waiving user fees for nonprofits to use facilities um, or using waiving user fees for Palm Springs residents living in poverty or something like that, right? So we're kind of only looking at the expenditure side of this and the, um, you know, requests for the general fund allocations. Um, but I do think that's like the broader conversation we can have um, holistically, like what are all those requests that we want to fund and, and how to best do it? Yeah, absolutely. And this is a good time. Again, I'm making notes on those items. Generally speaking, when when it's something that we had a pretty good idea about, um, something concrete enough that it could make it to a request for funding, it was located on this list. And we're about to get into the list of things that aren't recommended, at least presently as part of initial budget adoption. Some of the other areas, you're right. One of the reasons that we did not recommend spending the entirety of the available fund balance or um, the projected revenues over expenses is because we do have some of those other areas that you've described. Many of those right now are just not defined, which makes them very hard to account for. Um, so we can talk about placeholders if we think we know something about the scale of those investments. Um, but otherwise, that's one of the reasons we just simply always really, as a matter of practice, avoid allocating everything we have at budget time because it's, it's just, it's fluid. We're, we're always coming up with, you know, new ideas and priorities. Um, and, and even if we were to define some of the things you mentioned, we would still probably want to leave some of the money available for the next idea or the next um, 
responding to an opportunity, a grant opportunity or something like that. Um, so we can establish that list and we can put scale to it and put placeholders in the budget at council's direction. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Al along those lines, I know you have only one more thing on your list. Um, one thing I didn't, we don't have listed here is anything about workforce development. And I know we've, we've talked about this kind of in, in passing a lot, and we haven't really had an opportunity to, to dive into to what that would look like with the city. And I understand it, a lot of it is because it, it's, it's a big uh, request. But the city for many years had a workforce development program. It was federally funded, and when those federal dollars ran out, the program w was ended. I would, but it was a really huge help. And many of our Parks and Recs um, staff actually have were part of those those programs, and um, obviously it's been a huge benefit to those those residents. A lot of them are are locals, so I, I would like us to to get back into figuring out how we can allocate funding for workforce development, even if initially it's small. Because I think it is going to take time to fully develop something, but we, we do want to make sure that we're getting as, providing as many local jobs as possible and also decreasing um, the amount of staff turnover that we get simply because someone finds a job closer to their home. Um, you know, obviously we welcome staff from wherever they want to come from in, in California or the United States, but, um, or elsewhere, uh, but we do have, have issues with people commuting long hours to, to get here. Um, and our local residents, the city of Palm Springs is the best paying job you can, you can have in the city of, uh, you can have here. Um, I, and I don't, I, I would, I really think that might be true. <laughs> I, I know as, a, as an attorney, I was not getting paid as well as staff members <laughs> in the city of Palm Springs. Uh, so I want our locals to be able to take advantage of that. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I'll just note again that you know economic development is a great example of one of those unknown programs. Even some of the ones we know about and that we're investing in are unknown. So we have a placeholder for homeless services. We we have a general idea of scale. Uh, uh, as to what our partnership with Martha's will cost to operate a navigation center. But we have other areas that are still not defined, right? Like how much additional security might we need to honor a commitment to the neighborhood that will really be mindful of the potential for um, secondary impacts? Um, when it comes to housing, I already mentioned the same. Economic development is yet another example where, um, to some extent, these, these um, programs beg the question, well, well how much? Um, is it going to be one position or 10 at the end of the day? Sustainability is another, where we do contemplate adding at least one, if not two, staff people. But given the priority of climate action and the programmatic costs associated with it, how much more might we need? It's, it's hard to really get your arms around the whole thing at any given time. So we can work on putting more of those unknowns to some kind of scale, some, some estimated scale. One of the things I recommend at the end of the day is wherever we're at, you know, just, just suffice it to say there are going to be other new priorities that come about. And that's one of the reasons to be assertive in, in identifying areas for new investment, but also to hold a little something back for some of those future conversations. All of those are good examples. Um, and, and again, the police department, you know, as we do a review, if we're going to get into behavioral health and some other creative ways that we deliver services, what, what's it going to cost? Is that five people or, or 10 or 15? We, we just don't know. All the things we just talked about could rival all of the approvals that, that are before you, the recommendations that are before you, right? They, these, they're significant. So um, it's good to be thinking about those things and we can work to put a little more specificity behind some of the very general concepts, but, but a lot of it really does depend on how we build into those programs and what the expectation is. If I could pick up on uh, that, and I want to thank the mayor pro tem for raising it. Uh, one of the programs that uh, we've abandoned uh, is the student intern programs. And it's something I would like us to look at very seriously, most particularly uh, for some of our youth that are at risk. There is nothing better uh, than having a job. 
Th thank you. That's great. And, and I forgot to mention, as I was quite elaborate in, in the discussion of some of the unknown future budget needs, that one approach to both of those things you just mentioned is, is really a, potentially a shift in focus on how we recruit for positions. Getting people interested in city jobs earlier at an entry level <clears throat> and fostering their growth into higher levels of the organization over time. A lot of communities just make a concerted effort to recruit locally, and we can do that. That may require additional personnel, um, and, and in some instances, it might only require a shift in focus. So um, we, we hear you that we have opportunities to do a better job recruiting locals that are committed to the community, that are more likely to stay for an entire career, and, and not leave when they get an opportunity closer to home because they'll be as close as they can get. Other questions, comments? I have a question if I can, um, just from that. Um, so one other area is constituent services that council at least has frequently identified the need for um, and city staff has frankly struggled responding to all of the requests that we get. So I know that we had previously allocated more funding for a council assistant since we only have one for all five of us for scheduling. Um, is there a sense here? Was it analyzed um, how to increase staffing for council and for increasing constituent services? So in the current budget, there was money provided for a position that would help us with those services. So you'll recall that previously we had two, someone working in the city manager's office and someone assisting with council. And so we added um, at, at least one additional position, but we're still recruiting for the first. So right now, um, we have one person who used to help with council, helping with both council and, and me in the city manager's office. Um, we did just complete a recruitment, but have not yet successfully landed a recruit to fill the first of those positions, and then the second would be potentially this constituent services. We're trying to be a little flexible in the way we deploy those resources, because frankly, sometimes we get tunnel vision with, with our job descriptions. What I'd really like to do as we bring on the first of those two is, again, kind of reevaluate and, and look at the team and say, who's got the skill set? to really do some of the constituent services piece while not dropping anything or, or diminishing our level of service with maintaining the other administrative support that we all rely on. Um, so it might be that that constituent service person is on staff already, but needs to be freed up to do the job, right? So bottom line is we do have two positions funded that we can fill to help on the administrative end between the city manager's office and council. And then somebody mentioned grants earlier. We, we have actually, um, I think we're going to be presenting a contract. We've been through the procurement process. That was something that council also provided funding for in this year's budget. And we'll have a firm coming on board to do that work in the next few weeks, the next couple meetings. So, yeah, so some of those things are already provided for. It's just evidence of how long it sometimes takes to, to, to get those dollars um, on the street. Thank you. That'll be coming on the May 12th agenda. Just, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Just one thing on, on that in terms of the job descriptions. Um, I just want to flag this. It's one thing that I've had several people um, say, well, I, I can't I don't qualify for that job because there were so many specifics listed that they didn't want to apply, including someone who now has an interview because I pushed them and pushed them and pushed them to apply anyway. So I, I do want us to just flag that how we list our job descriptions is extremely onerous. Um, and I think we might be deterring people from applying because they don't check every single box because the way we list it seems that they must check every single box. And I don't think that's actually true. So if we can, I mean, this, I know this is not part of this discussion generally, so I just, but I just wanted to flag it while it was in my mind. Sure. Thank, thank you. Um, to the point about how we budget positions, this is also sometimes the reason why if we've submitted something very specific to you, like the communications position, and it's meant to do a certain job, why sometimes I suggest let us build some other components of the team and see where we're at. Because what if, what if we end up with those skills and need completely different ones? We feel that the more responsible thing to do would be to present it to you as 
as the, this other thing, right? Some of the job descriptions do have uh, minimum qualifications, and those you tend to need to have. Um, some are more entry level, and that goes back to the point about these positions that if we had some administrative assistance and somebody providing constituent services, which of those jobs requires what skill set, how much should each one pay, and, and that's further why you know I don't want to get locked into that position if it turns out we have somebody on the team that can do that, and what that may mean is issuing a different position with, with um, fewer barriers to entry that someone might meet the minimum qualifications for more readily. So we're always kind of looking at that, but um, I, I hear you. Some of our positions, that, especially the ones that require technical expertise, sometimes have pre-qualifications that make it difficult, all to the point about um, starting our recruitment at entry level and really developing people for those opportunities once they're already in the organization. Any other questions or comments? I have a comment if I can, sorry, Mayor, it's ping-ponging all over the place. Um, I have a question or a comment really about the Measure G, G, Measure J use of funds. So I really agree with the vice chair of the commission who called in and we've been really careful to use Measure J resources, not for staffing, but for infrastructure and for the items identified in the, um, initiative that the voters passed. So I do think that's important. And then I think we should clarify the role of the Measure J Commission because it sounds like there's frustration over role and responsibility and just um, write that the Measure J Commission is intended to be an oversight commission is how it was phrased in the ordinance um, or in the initiative, but really has never functioned that way because from the beginning, Measure J was making recommendations. And I know the mayor, you know, raised this issue too, that, you know, how is an oversight commission making recommendations? So I think we should um, clear up that uh, frustration with the committee um, so that we can just be clear because um, it should be used for infrastructure. There's always a concern that it'll be whittled away for, for operating expenses for the city or for staffing. So maybe it makes sense to have a Measure J, you know, person who's doing those projects funded by that fund. Um, and I think that could be acceptable as we really work to make sure all the funds have all of the expenses for operation um, allocated to them. And I've raised this before in a few other budget cycles, but I just want to flag, we made a separate fund for Measure J. Um, similarly, voters voted to approve Measure D for public safety, but we've never really um, identified that separately um, in a way that we use those funds for uh, Measure D and public safety. And while it's a general tax and we can do that, it might make sense to really think about the measure, um, that revenue and how much we're allocating to public safety. So I just wanted to, to comment that um, as we talk about the use of Measure J funds. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, I think we can proceed. Thank you. Um, we only have one more um, line item in the recommended new investments, and that's for security services at uh, three recreation centers. Uh, we just think that this is um, needed to make sure that our team and our patrons feel safe. It's not all the time that we have incidents, but they happen often enough that we think security at those facilities in particular is warranted. So the only challenge that I see there is that we've leaned pretty heavily on our contracted services. And in this labor market where it's been difficult to hire people, um, we're already not performing all of the security we would otherwise procure because I think staffing shortages make that difficult. So we may need to look internally at, at how we do this, but bottom line is uh, we think it's appropriate to make the investment. That wraps up um, a pretty lengthy list of potential new investments while, again, saving some resources for some of the areas that have been described tonight or as we move into the next fiscal year and beyond. So I, I don't want to spend as much time, but I want to make sure you understand that we have another small list of, of things that weren't recommended for funding this cycle. The primary reason uh, or the things that they have all in common is at the end of the day, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're trying to balance 
um, our, our desire to be somewhat um, assertive with a new spending plan. It was mentioned earlier that sometimes you create a few positions and it takes you a year to fill them all, right? So we've created a few uh, police department positions right now. We still have some vacancies in that department. So we, wanna, we don't want uh, the limit of what's allocated to be what holds us back. But the point is what you just saw, if council were inclined to agree with those recommendations and fund those things, it's gonna take us a while to build into that. Meanwhile, some of these other positions, the need and the want and the, the fact that these would enhance service levels don't go away. Um, we would likely revisit some of these. So when we say we're, they're not recommended, it's not because they don't stand on their own, it's because we've taken a nice bite of the apple with what's recommended and would think that these things should be evaluated at some future date in the context of priorities at that time. Um, would it be fair to say that uh, we've been conservative in our revenue projections for 20 to 23 and that uh, if in fact the revenue comes in much more robustly than what we projected, then we're in a better position to come back and revisit uh, some of these uh, items that are not recommended at this time. Absolutely, that's the case. Now, just, just to clarify, we're coming off a year where we've seen really remarkable, borderline unprecedented growth in areas like TOT. And what we're projecting next year is that they continue to grow, but at a far less pace than what we saw this year. And it, that begs the question, um, in, in a post-pandemic environment, are we seeing a lot of drive market traffic? And as people return to fly destinations, will that impact the overall level of tourism? The, I don't think anyone has that crystal ball. Is a recession somewhere on the 12-month horizon, the 24 to 36? We've all heard different prognosticators predict what they think but it's going to come at some point. So bottom line is we're projecting some growth. If growth is more robust, yes, we have opportunities. Even if it just comes in how we predicted it will, there's still the opportunity to talk about some additional investments mid-year. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. And I think I want to echo again Councilmember Holstage's comment about um, balancing right uh, staffing versus capital improvement projects and and I think this is exactly why right this this conversation that we're having right now how much is this going to grow how much of is it going to decline a bit as we just see how people's comfort levels change um, I, I know for instance right now more people are not wanting to fly because of the restrictions were lifted so how is this all going to impact um, so I am interested in I don't know if it's this next budget discussion or if it's a third budget discussion, but I would like to have an opportunity for us to discuss that, the, what, do, what are our priorities in terms of staffing and, and capital improvement, um, and, and maybe we do need a, a third day or, or the end of the next meeting to really kind of flesh it out more, because I do want us to have enough time to go through this, this CIP without like we are like we're doing right now um, what what might be um, equally important there because the the full CIP is quite a, a document um, and and sometimes it gets a little obscured when you have something like a big bridge project where there might be federal funding and it makes it sound like it's much bigger than it is. I think what we could probably do is look at the incoming sources, noting that we almost always leverage some grants and things like that for you know whatever it is, playground equipment or what have you. And that can be hard to predict, but at very least we should be able to look at what is incoming. One of the really nice things we have right now is Measure J. A lot of communities that don't have a dedicated source to capital either dedicate some portion of their major tax um, revenue, or at the end of every year when there's a little bit of a surplus, they put some of that surplus in capital. And the city of Palm Springs has done that historically, right? To say, we know we're going to need to supplement those other sources. If we look at it as it stands now without some of that general fund support, I think our capital, uh, our available resources is significant, but it's because of Measure J. Without it, I, I, I think you would have to make a, a more robust ongoing commitment from the general fund to, pr to prop that up. 
So let's look at it a little bit that way when we present it. You'll also see the totality of it, which, which will demonstrate some of the power of leveraging some of those other resources. Um, and, and you can give better direction by the end to say, if you really think we need to be doing much more in capital, again, you have some resources still available without looking at some of these recommendations. If you want to go beyond that to reduce our investment in some of these operations to ensure that we can have a more aggressive um, capital strategy, then, then we can do that as well. Um, Council Member okay. Kors. Great. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so just on the staffing, and I see the positions, you know, that are, um, would be great to have that just not right now for the budget, but good to, as we talked about earlier, having that total number. So we're thinking about it. Um, just a few others I just wanted to mention in that. I know for probably as long as I've been on council, there's been requests that we add a long-term planner to the planning department, not just, you know, processing current things, but could really think long-term. Um, so just it would be great to get a sense of where the you know, planning building department are on that, if that's something they want to look at. Um, I've had this conversation uh, with the city manager, but um, at some point thinking about a uh, DEI diversity equity inclusion manager for the city um, and maybe shorter term having someone on staff who is the point person on that. Again, I know we're hiring an HR, so it might not be able to do it now, but I just wanted to um, keep that on the list, um, I'm avoiding some of my capital things, although most have been mentioned, so I think uh, by others already. Um, oh, and on the communications, um, sort of social media, uh, public affairs communications, I, your reasoning for not doing that now makes sense to me, uh, but just if we need to do some one-time spending for more consultant support, um, while you know new positions being hired and we see what their skill set is, I'd be, you know, interested in you bringing back something like that with the budget as well. Thank you. That's all I had. All right. And other other questions, comments? And if I could just respond very briefly, mm -hmm. um, we have talked about things like a long range planner, and so very similarly to some of the others, we'd like to see what happens as we bring on a new director, but do see the need for those kinds of positions moving forward. Right. Council Member Woods. Uh, thank you. Thank you to all. I don't know if the um, public knows this, but a lot of our directors are sitting in the audience. Uh, they have a very difficult job managing. I think it's an excess of 500 employees here in the city. And I thank you for your work and your hard work in rallying everyone to be on the train with us, which sometimes we're all over the board. So this is a good start. I want to thank you. Um, I agree with the recommendations. I also agree with a lot of the comments made by my fellow council members, and I'll just kind of quickly repeat them. Uh, more information on number 27, which is marketing and tourism and what that's going to do. On number 37, which is the CalPERS Reserve, I'd just like to go a little further, although it's not a budget thing for this, this particular time, but to really understand our CalPERS liability better, and I don't know if we bring on a consultant for that or do something, but really what does it mean long term for the city, and what should we be doing now? I think um, uh, Mayor Middleton mentioned um, um, some options, but just to look at what those might be. Um, I also agree with the comments made on the Plaza Theater, you know, whether we do it now or later or how we do it and whether it's a foundation that runs it or a fund, we really need to look at in the broader scope of all our priorities. Um, I also agree that um, looking at some additional employees that aren't here, be it now or in the future, such as an advanced planner, which uh, we've talked about, uh, communication people, um, economic development, whatever we think we need. Um, and I understand that we can possibly do that mid-year, but just to keep it on mind as we want to move forward with particular, particular goals. Um, I also agree um, um, uh, with Council Member Holstage that we really need to look at Measure J and kind of what expectations are, what their role is, all of that compared to what the ordinance actually says and the other funding sources as well and how we, we spend those. I understand Measure J is not part of this. It's a little disjointed a bit how we're doing it and if we can find a way to make it less disjointed where one body is trying to recommend and think that they're doing it and, and we're really the, the body and how do, we, how do we mitigate all of that? I think it's very difficult. I brought this up before about Measure J. I have some concerns. I also agree that we should look at the library at some point and what that means. Um, we have a plan for the library. Um, but I think what's important about that is that 
we have done a plan for the library. We've done a plan for Desert Gateway. We've got other specific plans. None of that work in those plans is funded. And I think that, and is that going to be a priority for us or not? Um, and if not, I think we, the residents have a right to know um, whether that will be a priority or not. So I think um, understanding um, what that means. I also agree that um, one of the callers talked about open space. Uh, this is a time if we've got an excess funding source, maybe we define some areas that we currently own as open space and kind of close the loop on some of those discussions. I agree with Mayor, Mayor Middleton, and I know it's coming forth about roadways, and also uh, with Mayor Pro Tem, who also talked about roadways, uh, traffic, but I would add traffic calming to all of that, as we need to fund our traffic calming much better. I know this may come out in our next process uh, that we're coming from, but also to, how do we implement our safe routes to schools, some other plans that we've got. You know, those are all unfunded. We've done these great plans, and if they sit on the shelf too long, uh, they gather dust and um, uh, we don't have any opportunities. Then they get old and we have to redo them. So I think we need to look at, are we gonna fund some of that roadways, traffic calming, bike lanes, safe routes to schools, sidewalks, and all of that? Um, I think that's uh, important to do. Um, also, when we come back with um, kind of a capital improvements, one of the things we talked about was um, uh, uh, connecting to the sewer on those areas that don't have sewer connection, and we've started some studies in the Mika track. Um, what else does that need to happen? Um, I also want to make sure, as a question, that our vacation rental department is staffed correctly, because daily new vac illegal vacation rentals pop up, um, and people take them down, like for Coachella and whatnot. Do we have sufficient staffing to kind of, you know? Um, uh, keep control under that. I know anytime somebody does an illegal one, it's very difficult to track, but I don't think it's good that we have as many uh, illegal rentals out there as you can find online. I think that's um, really important. Um, I also think what's not added here is um, commission training, um, commissioner training, uh, especially things like the planning commission, to be able to go to a conference to learn best practices. But even more than that, I think a commission dinner at some point, once a year, an annual dinner is not funded in here, would be a great thing um, to fund. Um, and I think um, we also really need to look at our parks. Um, and this could be through the Capital Improvement Project. We've done a bit of work to Desert Highlands. Um, we've done a bit of work to Duluth. People want pickleball courts. All the pickleball courts are in one part of the town. Um, we have Victoria Park that's not really seen any improvements. It's seen some changes to um, maintenance on it. Um, but, you know, something with that as well, and there's been some requests for that, uh, including a shade structure. And some of those requests were put in through Measure J, but I'd like to see those actually um, move forward. And I think the last thing that I'd like to see is, um, is um, our visitor center and our palm trees when you enter the city. Um, are really in bad repair. I think the visitor center, there's been a whole movement by preservationists to light that visitor center in the evening and they've got a cost down and they've got bids and everything. But even the, the palm trees when you come into our city are, are very badly lit and there's no lighting on the sidewalks. And currently all those palm trees have a single light that goes up. Where downtown they have lights that go up but then they, we also have pedestrian lights and it's very, very dark on the north side. And I'm suggesting we look at the rings that go around the trees that shoot a couple lights up and a couple lights down to make that seem less ominous and safer as you, as you enter the city. So those are just a few things. As you put it together, I wanted to kind of put a kind of a, a seed in everyone's ear as we go through it, but I think you know it kind of um, covers the, um, some of the stuff that's more than just what was in this staff report may come out in the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Uh, have we given you the kind of direction you need this evening? Council, I've got a couple of pages of notes. Um, I think let us work on some of this. We already had in mind to come back and talk about capital. We have the airport to catch up on. We have some of the other smaller funds. I just want to point out that the way the schedule worked, we were kind of targeting having study sessions once a month, which often puts you know three or four weeks in between meetings. 
This time, um, the next study session is scheduled for May 4th, which is really right around the corner. So a lot of these suggestions that might take some additional analysis will probably not be ready by then. You will get partway down the road by better understanding the capital improvements plan, the various sources of revenue, what is already programmed in. Um, but some of these things we'll probably have to follow up on at a later date. We'll do our best in that mm -hmm. short time frame to prepare for many of them. But what we may need to do is either um, bring you some requests to consider, or again, um, some of these notes may be things that we visit you know, throughout the year as well. Um, depending on how far we can get with this budget season, especially some of the bigger things that are a little more off in the distance, like economic development programs and things like that. Um, but we've got a lot to, to chew on and, and to try to um, get you some information back. And so I think we're pretty good if there aren't additional questions on what we've presented this evening. Uh, it, it sounds like there's some fairly general agreement pending the balance of the budget that the kinds of Investments we've recommended at this point are viewed favorably. Again, the caveat being that as we look at capital and some other things, you may, of course, you reserve the right to shift some focus, but I'm not hearing that anything we've presented is way off the mark. Am I right about that? I think, I think you are. And I would add that uh, I think all of us understand uh, the month of May and the first few weeks of June are going to be ones that are heavily uh, concentrated on issues around the budget. And uh, that's something that we simply have to prioritize this time of year. If uh, Council Member Halstage. Thank you. I um, really appreciate all of your work and sorry, so sorry to city staff for giving us giving so many hours of feedback, um, but I think overall really support the recommendations. Um, I just have a few changes or, or notes that I might request come back or council can discuss. So one, I heard the police chief say that if we fund nine firefighters instead of six, we get to a better rating and provide better service. So I don't know where council is, but I'd like to see an analysis either how to do that in this budget, um, since we are leaving so much in reserves, you know, if we have the capacity to do that, you know, how an analysis of how long it really will take to use that funding that we allocate, um, or if not, how to get there. And then I wanted to support council member Kors's comments about the digital communications manager, um, because that is a huge need for us. And maybe it's just us, but you know, if we're losing the war of misinformation and we're doing really incredible work and we're not communicating it to the public. And then likewise, you know, we have basic information like the playground at Victoria Park is going to be closed for months um, that, you know, we don't know and it's hard to communicate. So I think that frustrates our residents and then we get the brunt of that on social media and elsewhere. So I really think investing in our uh, social media is incredibly important, our communications overall. So I will support the city manager's recommendation if we can't use this position now, but I agree that we should definitely be contracting those services. We have the funding to do all this incredible work and we're not funding communicating it, which almost means like it doesn't happen for our residents and people literally think, all kinds of things about the $10 million for homelessness and everything else. So I personally, as a council member, would very much like to see more investment um, in that, you know, communication manager or contract services until then. And those are really the only changes um, overall I have other than the, the items that we've discussed just for more information. Any other questions or comments from any of my colleagues? Then I believe we have reached uh, the uh, time to adjourn uh, this study session at 8.15. We will be resuming at 5.30 on May 4th with a second uh, study session, I believe concentrating on budget issues. We will be back for our regular meeting on May 12th at 5.30. Uh, and I also invite everyone to come out to the Plaza Theater for the State of City uh, at 5 p.m. on uh, May 3rd. There is both uh, free and uh, 
ticketed uh, opportunities to event, attend that event, uh, and it's going to be a really important uh, opportunity uh, for us to talk about what we have accomplished in the last year and what we need to accomplish moving forward. Uh, again, thank you all. Please stay safe out there.